chairing this afternoon's hearing of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded, is being live streamed at boston.gov slash city council TV and broadcasted on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Uh, you can attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We'll take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and also at the three hearings dedicated solely to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov slash council budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony are tomorrow, May 2nd at 2 p.m., Tuesday, May 9th at 6 p.m., and Thursday, May 18th at 2 p.m. Uh, for virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation slash residence and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. You can email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. You can submit a two minute video of testimony of your testimony through the form on our website. And for more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov slash council budget. Today's hearings are on dockets 0760 through 0762 orders for the fiscal year 24 operational budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department for other post employment benefits dockets 063 0765 and uh, and 0766 which are orders for capital fund transfer appropriations and dockets 0764 0767 0768 which are orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Docket 0774, which is a message in order authorizing a limit for the Environment Conservation Commission revolving fund for the fiscal year 2024, for the purpose of securing outside consultants, including engineers, wetland scientists, wildlife biologists, or other experts in order to aid in the review of proposed projects to the commission, per the city's ordinance protecting local wetland and promoting climate change adapt adaption, adaptation. The revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from the fees imposed by the commission for the purpose of securing outside consultants. The environment department will be the only department authorized to expend from the fund and such, expen such expenditures shall be capped at $50,000 and docket 0781, which is a message in order authorizing the appropriation of $1,200,000 for the income of the George Francis Parkman Fund. The funds are to be expended under the direction of the commissioner of parks and recreation for the maintenance and improvement of Boston Common and Parks in existence since January 12, 1887. Our focus for this hearing will be fiscal year the fiscal year 24 budget for the Parks and Recreation Department, the Environment Department, the Office of Food Justice, the Parkman Fund, and revolving funds. Our panelists from the administration for today's hearings are Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, Chief of the Environment, Energy, and Open Space, Ryan Woods, Commissioner of the Parks and Recreation Department, Kathy Baker Eclipse, Director of the Capital Plan, Parks and Recreation Department, Tracy Lee, Finance Director for Parks, Darlene Buford, HR Director for Parks, Jose uh, Alteror, uh, General Superintendent for Parks Maintenance Parks, Dr. Allison Brizius, Environment Commissioner, Kat Eschel, Chief of Staff for the Office of Environment, Energy, and Open Space, and Elisa Wasserman, Director of the Office of Food Justice. This afternoon, I'm joined by my council colleagues, Councilor Julia Mejia and Councilor Rusi Lujen. I'll now turn over to the administration for their presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we will uh, go ahead and get started and be relatively brief. Um, we wanna make sure that we have plenty of space for um, counselor questions and then uh, public testimony. Um, but we'll go ahead and pull up our slides. Do we have that? Okay, great. Um, so I wanna begin by noting something um, that's pretty important. We often have separate um, hearings. We often have environment department has its own hearing. Parks has its own hearing. Um, food justice uh, is with us now. It was last year, but this is the first full budget year um, that food justice is under the EEOS cabinet budget. And we were not requested to give information for the Office of Historic Preservation, but they are nonetheless a very important part of our cabinet. Um, However, because we anticipated that there was going to be challenging to fit three, um, we decided to uh, not have an additional presentation related to the Office of Historic Preservation. But it's worth noting that they are part of 
of our cabinet. I did want to share really quickly, um, we spent some time this year figuring out what our cabinet mission statement would be, and it is the environment, energy, and open space cabinet works together to ensure that Boston is the most resilient and just city to live in. We strive to ensure that all Bostonians, and particularly our most vulnerable, have access to healthy, culturally appropriate food, affordable renewable energy, and climate resilient spaces to live and play. We steward and promote Boston's historical and natural spaces as we engage residents in a, re a robust conversation about our future. We co collaborate within the cabinet across the city and throughout our neighborhoods to ensure that every person, plant, and animal is able to live, grow, thrive, and die with dignity. It is worth noting, um, if you're asking about the animals, we do also have animal control in our cabinet. We won't be able to talk about that uh, for a significant time. Um, and also, some folks asked why we have die with dignity, because it is also worth noting that we have cemeteries within our cabinet. So um, we'll be focusing in on a few pieces, but wanted to make sure that we're clear um, about all of what is in the cabinet and um, the way that we really work together across all of the different pieces, trying to make sure that each uh, piece of our cabinet is also amplifying and um, supporting the other pieces. Next slide. Um, so wanna focus on the fact that this year, one of the things that is um, different is that in the past, the cabinet, um, all of the cabinet functions have been under the environment department. That has led something I think that's a, a little, uh, challenging in the sense that people considered my role, for instance, only to be connected to the environment cabinet. And the environment cabinet had both my job, the chief of staff, um, the director of communications, all of whom serve the entire cabinet, not just um, the environment department, as well as a director of administration and finance who currently will serve um, environment, office of historic preservation and the office of food justice while most of that infrastructure exists in parks and is not needed um, additional support, but that, that role the Director of Administration and Finance will serve across the other three uh, departments in the cabinet. Um, and then uh, a Director of Community Engagement, which we are moving forward now. We've got a lot of resumes, but if you are interested in really thinking about how we um, amplify community engagement across all of the cabinet, um, we'd love uh, for folks to apply for that position as we'll begin interviews, I think in about a week or so. Um, and then we've added a position, um, executive assistant to the chief, um, somebody who would be entirely focused on my schedule and keeping me where I'm supposed to be. Currently, I tap into the environment department's resources to make that happen. And again, one of the challenges with that, it means that the environment department's budget looks larger than it actually is because they are carrying all of the expenses for the entire cabinet. Um, we asked for a change in that, um, and so you'll see um, there's the Office of Environment, Energy, and Open Space um, that's the centralized cabinet team. That also means that we don't have to have each of our departments find a finance person. Each of our departments um, have someone who's exclusively doing community engagement. Um, we allow, we're able to have parts of those roles sit in each cabinet. Uh, but also to have a specialist that's able to move across multiple cabinets because uh, the Office of Food Justice, Office of Historic Preservation, and the uh, um, Environment Department are all relatively um, small in comparison um, and so can share some of those functions across. And so you can see here, uh, there'll be six roles at the cabinet level that has been the case in the past, but um, we're breaking it out so you can see what actually is funding the cabinet versus what actually is in the environment department. Next slide. So I'm going to hand it off um, to uh, Ryan Woods, our commissioner, to talk about um, the overview for the parks budget, but I wanted to at least note here because um, many of the values that you see under parks are also connected to the larger values that we have across the entire cabinet. There are six, equity, collaboration, growth mindset, accountability, excellence, and joy. Um, and we're hoping to hold those across everything we do. Um, and even this budget hearing could be a joyful hearing. We're working on that, bringing joy to everything uh, that we do. Um, and then we'll have each of the... Uh, 
departments go into a little bit of greater depth and then um, have space for questions at the end. Handing it over to you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilors, and Chief White Hammond. Uh, my name, as was stated, is Ryan Woods, and I'm proud to serve as the Commissioner of the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, joining me today, in case we have uh, a range of questions, is our Director of Capital Plan, Kathy Baker Clips, our Director of Finance, uh, Tracy Lee, Director of Human Resources, Darlene Buffett, and our General Superintendent of Maintenance, Josue Altidore. Uh, I'd like to thank the Council for their support of not only our department, but as we look forward and we currently look forward to working together in our upcoming fiscal year. Um, as the Chief mentioned, we have our cabinet-wide values inside the Parks Department. We focus on access, equity, excellence, and adaptability. And access is that Boston Parks ensure that all residents have that 10-minute walk to their nearest park. But now we focus on taking that additional steps to not only be ADA compliant, but to strive for universal accessibility when possible. Equity in our investment, our maintenance services, and renovation of capital projects throughout the city. Excellence, we strive not only to have the best park system, but one that leads in design and climate adaptation goals. And adaptability, we have to adapt to the needs of our residents in each community, adapt to the ever-changing climate. And as we return um, after this pandemic, we certainly are adapting to the way we engage with residents and provide safe and welcoming spaces. I wanna take a moment to thank the hardworking team at the Boston Parks and Recreation Department who work to ensure parks are clean, safe, and welcoming. I especially like to call out the members of our maintenance staff to clean and maintain our parks, our animal care and control staff that have been responding to animal emergencies and operate our animal shelter daily, our park rangers that ensure park rules are enforced, serve as ambassadors, that our parks are well programmed, and our cemetery staff who assist with the final preparations and assist grieving families. In this year's budget, uh, we have a proposed increase um, of 2.8 million in the operating budget to a total of 34 million. This includes three senior proje uh, project managers, uh, youth sports initiative in partnership with uh, the HHS and OEA cabinets, an all-in-call plumbing contract to assist with water features citywide, and a civic open space planning partnership with the BPDA. The proposed capital budget is 72.6 million which is $12.9 million higher than fiscal year 23. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to share some of the highlights um, from this past year. This year was a year of planning for us as we uh, completed and released the Urban Forest Plan, the Franklin Park Action Plan, Boston Common Master Plan, and the city's Open Space Plan. We expanded the Urban Forest Division and now have a director and three new arborists on staff, allowing us to better respond to tree issues, accomplish the goals of the urban forest plan and better maintain and expand our camp, uh, canopy. We planted 1,265 street trees and pruned 2,559. We rededicated the um, Shaw 54th uh, Memorial and unveiled the embrace as well as Freedom Plaza that honors um, the 65 civil rights leaders um, with our partners throughout the city. Last month, we broke ground um, on several different projects. We completed our newest land acquisition, uh, which is preserving public access to open space. In recreational programming, we had over 18,000 participants and 5,200 take place in free fitness classes. We increased our sports lighting time for an additional month until December to allow more usable time uh, due to warmer weather and climate change. So now people can use our courts um, and not just end in October, but play through November into December. A record-breaking 91,000 rounds of golf were played at William Devine and George Wright golf courses, and over 30,000 attendees took part in cultural programming with 108 free events. Our park rangers uh, are in their 40th year and continue to offer a wide range of responsibilities from ambassadors, programming, uh, informing, and providing public safety as well as natural resource management and the beloved mounted unit. In our animal care and control division, as the chief alluded to, they issued over 11,000 dog license permits and responded to 7,900 calls for service. The shelter provided care for 830 animals and adopted 107 pets to new homes. And they offered 1,500 free and low cost rabies vaccines and uh, gave away 400 free microchips. 
And our permitting division has been very busy. They issued 4,500 permits for weddings, athletics, and special events. And our cemetery division provided burial services for just over 520 families that lost a loved one. Our horticulture division uh, grows more than 67% of the plants uh, that are planted citywide. Um, and they planted 55,000 bulbs across the city. As we look into fiscal year 24, uh, we have several goals. Our first is protect and enhance our tree canopy. And we do that by fully staffing our urban forest division, start with uh, environmental justice neighborhood plantings, reduce our pruning wait times for public trees, and bring more forestry work in-house to reduce the reliance on outside contractors. We're also going to continue equity review on all hiring and promotional practices to ensure persons of color, women and Boston residents are in the final rounds of interviews. We identify areas of improvement in recreational programming and permitting and partner with HHS cabinet to improve access to sports opportunities throughout the city. We're also going to use the open space plan to direct our open space acquisitions while engaging with our civil open space planning. So in closing, the Parks Department always strives to do better, we can do better, and we're gonna to adapt to the times and ensure our public places are always safe and welcoming to all. Thank you for your time. I'm passing it on to Allison uh, Brizius from the Environment. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Chair and Councilors. As Ryan said, my name is Allison Brizius, and I am proud to serve as the Environment Commissioner for the city. Uh, we in the Environment Department support Mayor Wu's vision of enhancing environmental justice and quality of life uh, in Boston while focusing on achieving carbon neutrality while working to mitigate and prepare for the effects of climate change and protecting our natural resources. Uh, we do this uh, along a number of lines. Obviously, we have a carbon neutrality team that advances strategies for equitable emissions reduction, a climate resilience team preparing the city for those impacts of climate change, an environmental quality team that focuses on, in, on enhancing environmental justice and quality of life in Boston by protecting our air, water, and land resources, and an energy team dedicated to increasing energy affordability and energy efficiency and renewable energy across the city. I'd like to echo Commissioner Woods's thanks to our partners at the council and look forward to continuing to work with you. And I'd like to thank our dedicated team in the environment department that's working tirelessly to achieve these goals. A few notable highlights uh, from our budget this year. Uh, as the chief mentioned, we've been under undergoing some restructuring within both the department and the cabinet this year. We're also very excited to announce an additional $50 million of investments in Renew Boston Trust to continue the work of deep decarbonization and energy efficiency and uh, the investment in renewable energy generation in our municipal buildings with a po particular focus this year on our schools. We're also focusing on the expansion of the Birdo team to continue to support building owners and residents in achieving emissions performance standards that will be beginning in 2025. And working with the boss, another notable element is that working with the Boston Public Health Commission, uh, we're going to take on integrating noise inspections within a larger environmental compliance team there within the BPHC, which we think is going to be a more holistic approach to environmental compliance inspection and more efficiencies within that broader team. If you could go to the next slide, please. Again, to highlight a couple of our accomplishments that the team has been working hard on over the past year. These include the adoption of phase one and phase two of the building emissions reduction and disclosure ordinance regulations and the completion of our very first year under this new ordinance of buildings reporting and verifying their data under Birdo. We've uh, launched a mass save community first partnership to focus on helping residents in our environmental justice communities be able to take advantage of the Mass Safe program. Uh, re we've released a Climate Ready Boston Phase 2 reports for coastal resilience solutions for East Boston and Charlestown. And with that, completed, completed many years of planning and planning for uh, sea level rise and coastal storms across the 47 miles of our coastline, which really brings us into a new phase of focusing on implementation for our climate resilience work. We've launched a coastal risk management study with the US Army Corps of Engineers to focus on advancing much of that implementation across the coast, coast and are soon <laughs> to announce the launch of a new initiative on tree planting and private property. 
We're also proud that working with the transportation department, we're able to secure a reconnecting Chinatown grant to look at uh, reconnecting elements of that community while bringing new open space to the neighborhood. Uh, and we've been working uh, notably recently with our conservation commission and the urban wilds team within the parks department to advance the Mattahunt Woods urban wilds ecological restoration project. We're also happy to report that through Boston Community Choice Electricity in 2022 we've been able to save our residents over well, nearly 48 million dollars and increase our participation by 15% in the program uh, from March of 2022 through March of 2023. Um, and if we look towards our goals for the future, just a few to highlight include, as, as Commissioner Wood said and uh, Chief White Hammond, we're continuing our work on staff diversity, ensuring that we're embedding an equity review of hiring and promotions to ensure that Persons of color, women, and Boston residents are always in the final round for interviews for every role and that we're increasing uh, the diversity of our department uh, wherever we can. We're launching, we're continuing that work through the Birdo program. So we're, our goal is to complete our regulations development by the end of 2023 to ensure that there's enough time for buildings to achieve their 2025 emissions deadlines. We're developing, uh, we hope to develop resources for our retrofit hub and support, further support building owners and their strategies. As I said earlier, advanced deep energy retrofits through our schools and partnerships with the BHA. And then I'll continue to work through climate resilience to protect and enhance the tree canopy through the Tree Alliance for planting trees on public property and partnering, of course, with the, our, our partners in the cabinet in the Boston Parks Department and with the Planning and Development Agency Coastal Delivery Team to accelerate uh, coastal resilience projects. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Aliza and Food Justice. Thank you all. Alusi, you may be muted. You're still muted, Eliza. <laughs> yeah, we can't get your audio. All right, let's. All right, while she's doing that, I'll do the, a very quick uh, update on, and then hopefully she'll be able to get on. Um, I wasn't gonna go into full depth, was gonna leave that for a question, but it might as well really quickly. Um, we've been actually really doing a lot of work around diversity within the department. I think each, uh, or within the cabinet, each department has its own strengths and challenges in this, in this area. Um, but we've seen a real, um, some real progress as we've spent time really looking at numbers and really asking people to be intentional about how um, we look at positions. So I think uh, I was trying to pull up the numbers for the environment department really quickly. Uh, Allison, do you I have- if Kat, if Kat jumps forward two slides, you'll have them okay. right there. Um, and then we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll have Elisa by then. Uh, but as you can see um, here, uh, we've been making some progress. I think it's kind of hard to see probably for folks, but um, we've been making pretty significant progress, particularly in growing uh, Hispanic population within the environment department and just all overall raising the number of folks of color within uh, the department. The environment department is the place that we started really looking at this and really uh, asking people to take a hard look at their interview pool asking questions about when we don't have anyone in the pool, what can we do to attract new folks and to tap into new networks, really looking at where, who's getting our job, job postings and how do we make sure that it's even, people are even seeing it who might not know about the work that we're doing. And we're excited to, to note that that has, um, that effort has been paying off in um, substantial increases. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do, particularly at the, um, senior level um, and I want to take this moment to note, do we have Aliza back yet? Okay, you're on, can we hear you? Okay, we can hear you, great. So there's a series of, of positions that we're hiring for across um, 
the cabinet and just want to put in a plug. Um, also, OFJ has some new roles that literally posted this morning. Um, so we hope that folks, if you're on this and you are a community advocate or supporter of the Office of Food Justice, the Parks Department, or the Environment Department, and you are looking for work, we hope that you'll take a moment to look on um, our website, we have one website where we put sort of all of it together and hope that people will consider applying, particularly folks um, who are uh, folks of color and in parks department, particularly women um, in our maintenance division. And so we're looking in each of the, uh, at each of the places that we could increase diversity um, and, and really leaning in on specific steps you can take. So I'm gonna hand it over to Elisa to go back a couple slides and be able to do her piece. Thanks, Chief. Thanks uh, for the patience um, that you can hear me now. So my name is Aliza Wasserman. I'm the director of the Office of Food Justice. Um, thank you so much to the chair and to council. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you about our work as we've had a lot of transition in our office over the past year. The Office of Food Justice's mission is to build a food system that is equitable, resilient, sustainable, and just. And just over a year ago, the, the former Office of Food Access was reestablished as the Office of Food Justice within the EEOS cabinet. As part of our office's expanded breadth and scope, we are responsible for implementing the new Good Food Purchasing Program and developing additional systems change initiatives that address the food system's impacts. And food access remains at the core of the office's mission. Since August 2022, we've been partnering with Grow Boston to complete an internal strategic planning process with the chief uh, to develop strategic goals for the areas our two offices can jointly have the biggest impact on to move towards collective impact for food justice. Uh, to achieve this new mission, We've developed a new staff structure for the office, working with OBM, OHR, and Chief White Hammond starting um, this, this past December. Um, these new positions will better meet the office's current mission and functions. Um, as folks know, Office of Food Access took on a variety of different roles during the pandemic that were more heavily involved in food distribution and emergency response. And we are calibrating to balance um, how we move forward now with immediate needs um, balanced with systems and policy change goals um, that rely less on our office as a direct service provider, um, but continue to find new ways to work with community partners to better respond to needs um, of the broader system of food access organizations in Boston to build new ways for our office to function more as a convening body. Um, our budget for FY24 is level funded roughly maintenance budget at 1.371 million with a small increase to address personal, personnel shift from um, removing employee agreement positions and contracted services shifting to, the, to personnel. So they're now included there as personnel um, as, as part of this restructure of, of office positions. And we are building our team capacity and operations to align with our mission and to fill gaps that existed when the office was understaffed for uh, much of FY22 and the first half of FY23. Next slide, please. Uh, this past year, um, through city and ARPA investments, um, we operate, we ran the farmer's market coupon program at 20, 23 farmer's markets with $450,000 of fresh food um, provided between June and October, 2022 um, to low-income residents through both city and, and ARPA funding. Um, we, as part of a pilot raised bed garden program, we, we uh, worked with vendors to build 291 raised bed gardens for low-income households and provided 1,800 CSA or farm share produce boxes uh, that were distributed to low income elderly and or disabled Boston residents. We launched the good food purchasing program implementation um, of the city of the 2019 ordinance um, and partnered with BPS food and nutrition services to release an assessment of Boston public schools food spending from the 2019 to 2020 school year. Um, 
that was done by the Center on Good Food Purchasing. Um, we completed an internal strategic planning process with Grow Boston to set a three-year strategic direction for the future of the office um, with a focus on food justice and incorporating regional food systems and food production. Um, developed four strategic goals and, and the strategies and activities um, we will use to advance um, this food justice agenda with Grow Boston. And as mentioned, we restructured staffing for the office to better match our new focus and hire two new staff. Um, and as the chief mentioned, um, one full-time position and several others are currently in the hiring process and recently were just posted. Um, and as we finalize our strategic direction, our goals for FY24 um, are to improve our food access programming by pivoting our Boston Double Up Food Bucks program, which provides a 50% discount for SNAP participants purchasing fruits and vegetables at participating stores in the city. So we're pivoting that to larger stores in order to get dollars out into the community more effectively. Um, we will be iterating an improved farmer's market coupon program with ARBA funds and launching a planning process to determine a sustainable model to address affordability at farmer's markets beyond this period of ARBA funding. So planning for FY25. Um, and we are partnering with Grow Boston to build 300 raised bed gardens for low income residents who have experienced food insecurity um, in 2023. And then an additional several hundred will be um, built in, in spring of, of 2024 within FY24. And then as mentioned, implementation of the city's 2019 good food purchasing program ordinance is underway. Um, working closely with Boston Public Schools will be fully implementing the ordinance by the end of this year, as well as across other departments that have um, large scale contracts for food um, and by developing a community advisory council as part of the ordinance. In order to in support increased sourcing from small and BIPOC producers regionally um, by city departments, we are deepening our work engaging with the regional food supply chain, um, building on, on relationships that um, started during, during the pandemic um, to help us build a more resilient food system. And we have a new focus on food recovery. We're developing a comprehensive citywide approach to scaling up food recovery in the city in order to significantly increase the amount of edible fresh food that is rescued regionally for consumption by Boston residents. And that is available for emergency food organizations that can source this food to address food insecurity in Boston neighborhoods. As we move forward with our new strategic direction, really excited about new opportunities um, to, to develop our impact more upstream as well as deepen our programming in neighborhoods throughout Boston to impact residents access to healthy fresh food and the food systems that we are part of. Thank you. So we um, recognize that our time is, is a bit short but we'll just go through these really quickly. Um, we'll, this is also in the packet and if um, folks are interested in, in going and diving a little bit more deeply into these numbers, we um, would love to. I think the big thing that we would say is in terms of diversity, and equity, and inclusion, we've been really focusing on one, making sure that everybody understands where we are. Um, so we've been adding a question on diversity, on equity into our um, hiring processes for our leadership to make sure that it's not just something that we talk about with the city council every year, but everybody who have, makes any level of hiring decisions within the department has a clear understanding of where we are and where we need to go. Um, as you can see here within parks, there's a lot of um, diversity within the park de parks department overall um, in terms of, but overwhelmingly it is black and white. We need to do more to increase um, the number of Hispanic and Asian folks who are in part of the department. In addition, uh, we really have to take a hard look at where we are in terms of our leadership. And we've been um, having that conversation, conversation with leaders so that they understand that this is not just uh, something that the city council cares about or that I care about, but something that has to be carried across um, the entire department. Um, and we're moving forward in a number of different places. Um, one of them is I sit in now on some of the sort of 
top hiring decisions so that we have a second eye looking with a particular focus on diversity. Uh, we talked already about the environment department slide, which is next. Um, I already shared a little bit about where we have grown in this, this department. And then I think, did we add the OFJ slide? Yeah, so um, OFJ, much smaller department. Again, we're still paying attention to this, um, but uh, mostly in the upcoming hires that we, we have coming into the department. And um, we know that there's been questions about equitable procurement and that the large data set about for the whole city will be coming to the um, city council from the budget department, but we want to note a few things that we've done particularly. Um, as was noted, I think last year, we started talking about this, Parks Department was the pilot project for participation goals of minority and women-owned business and city contracts. There were some places in which that was successful and some places where we found some challenges. Um, we've stayed in conversation um, with uh, procurement to talk those through and also um, the BJRP department um, as there have been some concerns at the community level about how many people are coming from the neighborhoods that our parks are in versus what's being reported and really looking at how, how we might be able to strengthen that. As I know the city council already knows, there are some challenges in terms of the way that state laws are set up um, and, and our ability to, to set goals and to move them doesn't, uh, is not always aided by the way that the state sets up its rules in terms of um, how we have to move forward with um, contracting. But uh, the Environment Department also did some particular work on this, and that was particularly through the Renew Boston Trust. Um, we had a sit down about a year and a half ago with the primary contractor that leads that project, and we just asked them, what could you do to increase um, minority and women-owned businesses as subcontractors to the larger contract? And we were really excited. Um, we went from very low, I think it was not exactly zero, but very close. Um, and we're able to reach 41% participa participation in this newest contract. Um, and that was mostly with the lighting contract that we had um, this year. But again, we hope that we can see that continue to grow just by asking the questions, just by making sure everyone is on the same page and then beginning to set forward um, concrete plans for how we um, change um, and how we create more opportunities for inclusion. Next slide. And so we are thankful. We are more than willing to go into anything else any, and that you want more depth on. Um, we, we are a little bit behind where we had hoped to finish. So I will stop there um, and make sure that um, we can be responsive to questions that uh, counselors might have. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I know we have several really important departments uh, and we've been joined by Council President Ed Flynn, Councilor Coletta, uh, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Flaherty, and Councilor Braden. I'm gonna go in order of arrival. Uh, we're gonna try and keep questions here to five minutes. I'm gonna set a timer um, when it is your time, uh, just to make sure that this moves as, as well as it can. I am going to sort of try to butt in and just say you are at five minutes. If you're in the middle of a question or there's an answer coming for your question, then we'll let that ride. Uh, but I am going to have a five minute timer. Uh, and so we're going to start with Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, the floor is yours for your questions. All right, well, she gets that figured out. We're going to go to Councillor Louis Jen. Thank you, Councillor Roy. I want to. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Uh, uh, she figured it out. There you go. Council here, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Sorry, thank you. And I'm having a little bit of difficulty because my mouth is swollen and my face is too. Um, so I don't want to talk too much, um, but I just have a, a few questions in regards to um, overall, I saw a slide around the diversity and inclusion. And if you could just talk to me a little bit about um, procurement and contracting and kind of like the role your office is playing to help support um, smaller minority owned businesses and, and folks to kind of, if you say, get a piece of that pie. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, the OFJ has been a little less engaged in that, although we do have one contract that um, is with the uh, MWBE. Um, but uh, particularly in the environment department, the main focus has been in our Renew Boston Trust. Um, that's the main place that we do any level of, of major contracting. Um, environment doesn't procure a lot of services, but this is the one place that it really does. And so uh, we began a conversation with uh, the Honeywell, which is the company that we work with to do the majority of that work, um, and just started asking the question, what are you doing to increase the number of women and minority owned businesses? Um, we talked about how they might be able to break some contracts down and uh, work through some specifics. And then the main key was that in this upcoming year, we were able to increase the amount of MWBE participation to 41% because um, particularly of the way they approached our most re recent lighting contract, which is a great place to do that um, because it could be broken apart in some, some um, exciting ways. So that's one of the places that we've seen real progress. We hope to continue that as they're doing energy assessments and other pieces. One of the smaller challenges for some of those is that um, particularly as we do work in schools, uh, we, we need that work to be done very quickly <laughs> uh, because we have to get it all done in the summer. So that will be one of the places that are more challenging because working with different co um, contractors sometimes can increase the time that it takes, but we believe that we can do it really well in other municipal buildings where we don't have sort of the same level of time constraints. I'm not saying that we won't try in the BPS pieces too, uh, but one of the things that they've raised is um, having four different contractors when you only have like about eight weeks to get it done can create challenges in terms of the handoffs, but um, other municipal buildings, we have a lot more opportunity to get that done. So that's what we're doing in terms of environment. In parks, um, we were actually one of the first department, I believe, to um, lean in for the equitable procurement in terms of uh, Malcolm X Park. And we hit the goals. Um, so I, I will say that. I, I wanna also note that we, um, there were some places where we were not quite as satisfied as, as um, we would like. Um, particularly, there were a lot of folks who wanted to see folks from that neighborhood be able to do the work on the park. Um, and that was very challenging to achieve for a variety of reasons. Um, doing the work in that neighborhood had us meeting with not just equitable procurement, but also um, the BJRP team, looking at what uh, contractors have to report and then what we might be able to do to influence more um, hiring from within the neighborhood. Right now, we don't really exactly know what mechanism that we can use because we still have to take the lowest bid by state um, rules. And we were able to say, we consider you non-responsive um, or non-responsible if you didn't even attempt to um, find contractors. We did have people who said, well, we couldn't find them. And we said that if some were able to find them, then we trusted that all should be able to find them. And so we are holding people accountable um, to the fact that at this point, the things that we've put in there as goals are reflective of the fact that there are businesses out there that folks could have contracted with. And if they didn't, we considered it non-responsible um, in terms of uh, the bidding. And I want to note that we had hoped it would lead to greater levels of um, visible engagement, and it didn't. Um, and so that's a place where we're continuing to figure out what can we do within the confines of state laws um, to make sure that more of the folks in our neighborhoods are able to access these jobs. There are some challenges in the sense that like folks have to have the proper certifications to even be put on a crew, and that contractors don't hire new crews every single time they do a job. And so they tend to come with a crew that's already um, been put together. And that doesn't always mean um, there's space for folks in the neighborhood to be able to have access to those jobs. So more than willing to talk about all uh, the work and follow up and research we did around what we can and can't do. Um, but we did hit the goals in terms of uh, minority and women contractors. That's great. Uh, what we I didn't get to is that level of community uh, jobs. Oh my God, if I couldn't be off camera, you would see me saying, okay, I got one more question in there. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, 
one more question, because I see Councilor Arroyo um, has been back on screen, but I just wanted to uh, uplift that we've been getting a lot of um, calls from residents who live in lower income neighborhoods about the conditions of their parks in comparison to others in terms of maintenance and upkeep. And I'm just curious about kind of uh, staying within the lines of racial equity and just kind of like how we're dividing up our resources, kind of just, if you can just on the record, just share for us kind of, so, so people can understand upkeep and so that, you know, they're not making assumptions that just because they live in a lower income neighborhood, they get less treatment and upkeep. Yep. So one, I hope that you'll share those with us so that we can actually look at them, look at the specific um, parks and really lean in on that conversation. Um, what I will say is this, um, we are really grateful for the resources that we have. And I need to be honest about the fact that we don't have one employee per all of our properties. Um, and so that we do move on a schedule. Um, we have tried to take a deep look and make sure that um, the resources are evenly distributed across um, neighborhoods in, in line with the number of parks that we have, the complexity of those parks. Um, and I will say that we, we get both uh, strong uh, support, but also concerns across the city because we are dividing resources pretty close to what we can do. <laughs> um, so I will, you know, I, I'm more than willing to look at if there's a particular park and there's some concerns. Um, we are taking a real equity lens in terms of which parks we prioritize for um, uh, renovation, because that is another thing that people have lifted up. And that is true, um, as we've looked at it, there have been sometimes faster renovation cycles in um, some neighborhoods versus others. Um, and so that's something that we are working hard together to make sure that we take a real focus on, we are really focusing on equity in terms of which places that we renovate. But we'd be more than ha happy to hear um, from folks uh, I, I do think we we have tried to set it up so that it is evenly distributed, but want to hear people's feedback if there's some questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say that it's just so reaffirming um, when when we have hearings like this and people share like the the pluses and the deltas and everything that's happening. Um, and it's encouraging because then our constituents who are listening in see that we are not saying well, it's not happening, but that we acknowledge and then we say, here's how we're trying to course correct it. So I really do appreciate you uh, doing just that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilor Arroyo. I really do appreciate the opportunity to ask my questions. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Feel better. Uh, Councilor Louis Jen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you and wanna thank the administration um, for being here. I found the presentation to be really detailed um, and um, excited to see an increase in the budget to address um, a lot of the concerns that have been elevated. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to really hear uh, Reverend Mariama White Hammond about um, the equity lens that you're bringing to this work, especially when it comes to upper management, um, especially when it comes to justice-based offices. So um, thank you. Uh, my, my first question is about open acquisitions um, and about um, sort of where we stand with that. So uh, what the budget is for our open acquisitions and a related question is how are we thinking about the cliff effect for things that were funding, funded via ARPA where we may not have that influx of, uh, of funds again, but where we've seen like a, um, an important, uh, where we've seen you saw relevant or important growth as a result of the ARPA funds that we want to continue after ARPA. Um, so I'll answer the first, the second question first and then go to the other. Um, so we actually were really careful about the way that we used ARPA, try, not trying to put it into things that we knew we wouldn't be able to sustain. So for instance, we do have a backlog on pruning, but we also are growing the tree division. So at some point, um, we are building up our capacity to be able to handle that, but there's a backlog right now. And so we um, set it up so that we could use some of our ARPA funds to bring that backlog down, to do some of the tree pruning, to recognize that we've gotten behind, but at the same time, we'll have that tree division growing in such a way that it should, its capacity 
should um, grow in such a way that it can take over that and not be in the, um, in the same sort of predicament uh, year over year. Um, so in terms of acquisition, uh, we are looking at this pretty closely um, with the starting from the neighborhoods where, um, the, so the urban, uh, can't, urban um, forest plan and the heat plan were really looked at together. Um, this question of what are our hottest neighborhoods? What are our neighborhoods that are seeing the impact of having insufficient tree canopy and insufficient open space? And so the, the resources that we have for acquisition are really being driven um, by where our communities are in most need of, a fish, of, of open space. So as one of the things that um, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Brizius brought up is that um, the Environment Department sought a grant with the Streets Cabinet um, to look at what's called reconnecting communities, particularly in the Chinatown neighborhood, because so much land and open space was lost when Highway 90 was built in Chinatown. As a result of that, we see all of the th challenges that you would expect with a highway being there in terms of air quality, et cetera, et cetera. So we um, are prioritizing acquisitions in neighborhoods where we have insufficient tree canopy and insufficient um, open space. And we have $10 million um, in capital with also, I wanna lift up CPA, which has also been a real partner in this conversation. We've been working together um, to look at how we could support um, not just acquisition, acquisition is a huge part, but also how are we all supporting uh, our EJ communities that have parks to be able to do more of the park beautification and amplification that um, has sometimes been easier to get done in some of our higher income neighborhoods. And so that's a piece of what we're doing. We're not just trying to acquire the land, but also try to support people to use um, that land uh, and to amplify that land in, in important ways. So uh, the two pieces that we are most looking at, uh, Spray Pond is a big piece that we were able to do in this last year in Hyde Park. Uh, we prioritized that not because it was in, um, the, not, less because there was sort of as much of a uh, open space dearth, although it is in a higher sort of heat zone within Hyde Park, but um, because it had importance, historical importance, uh, both to um, African American community with the 54th Regiment having been there, and also the Native American community in terms of um, their connection to the to Sprague Pond, and the opportunity to preserve a pond and public access to a pond, which we don't have very many. Uh, quite frankly, there are not as many in the state, but certainly not in an urban area. Um, so that's one example of a place that we've really leaned in on, on acquisition. And we're excited because it does bring together multiple parts of the cabinet. We'll be doing some archeological surveying. Um, it, it's gonna really be an amazing opportunity to, to celebrate in multiple ways. And then the other um, space that we are in negotiation about um, right now, but getting very, very, very close. And I, I think it's not too much to, it said the sense of the mayor lifted it up a bit at the state of the city, but Eggleston um, Peace Garden, where neighbors have been organizing for years to keep that space open. And we were able to come to an agreement with Clear Channel um, to really work that forward. We'll have something more formal. Don't go tweet it out, everyone, because we want to obviously get it all done, but we are very, very, very close. So again, really looking at places where um, there are some unique opportunities, but also a huge focus on where do we have a lack of open space. Again, we have um, 3.5 million this year that we are moving through and, and, and spending. Um, we have that acquisition coming like imminently. And then we also have $10 million in the budget for next year. Um, and, and again, as, you, as we mentioned, Chinatown is one of the places that we're uh, really looking on that, but we are open to other places and open to people bringing forward other opportunities. Thank you, uh, Chief. Um, Want to thank you for uplifting Sprague County. That was a great example, and excited for the work um, in Chinatown. Um, when we look at EJ communities, I think that's exactly what we should be centering. Two last questions: one around. Um, uh, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit more around how your office, and I think you did it when uh, Councilor Mejia asked you a question, but uh, how your office is thinking about BRJP and how it relates to um, our numbers. Just would, would like to hear a little bit more on that. And then, you know, I think a question um, with respect to the capital budget, excited to see an increase in the number of 
uh, parks that have made it. Like, you know, there are some parks that don't make it, and, and some of those parks, I, 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 you know, Ross Playground, Ross uh, being one of the the parks that I care about deeply, being my uh, neighborhood park growing up, and one that neighbors have really been asking for some attention. Just you know, if, if we can get a better understanding of what it takes for certain parks to be included um, in sort of that, that that planning, I think that would be helpful for for residents and folks at home. Thank you, and for sure. myself, not just not just residents at home. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, okay, the first, your first question, oh, BRJP. So I'll, I'm just gonna be really clear. We now have a really good understanding of how it works and why it's not working in the way we want it to. We have less of a clarity about what we do about it because from what we can understand, there's some challenges in terms of the state law. So one is that when people bid on a project, you can't ask them sort of in advance who their crew is going to be um and most of the time what they do is they keep a same crew moving sort of project to project the problem with that is that you know you could have the same crew moving ac across the city and as long as some of them are boston residents some of them are people of color some of them are women they actually um are in compliance with the boston jobs residency policy so we know that people want to see more local hiring in jobs. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not exactly sure. How do we move for that um, at the same time to remain in compliance with state law? Because one of the things we wanted to look at is, could we give people points, for instance, in the hiring process, if they were able to demonstrate at the previous hiring process, they were they did a good job of increasing the number of, of um, residents. We were told not within the state regulations, we're not allowed to give people extra points if they we can only consider that they're either compliant or they're what we call responsive and responsible, right? Like if they, for instance, completely messed up a job and they you know had a, had a, a record of doing things incorrectly, we might have, we might have some um, standing to say, no, we don't wanna work with you anymore. But from what I can see, we're not able to reject people's bid um, because they didn't, uh, as long as they complied with what the BJRP says, we are not able to sort of say, this project is in Roxbury, we want you to look at Roxbury residents. That's, a, a level of detail that what we've heard it, we're not able to do in compliance with state law. So I'm completely open. I've heard the, the feedback from, to, from residents. We love a solution. Um, we spent some time really thinking about it and working about it. Um, yeah. So I just want to be honest about where we are. We're in a information gap, we've actually really gathered all the information we need and now we're in a bit of a stuck place in terms of are there ways to, to be even more hyper-local in our projects. From what we currently understand, there are not if we're going to be in compliance with state law. But welcome suggestions, models, things people I think we could be doing and, and remain in, um, in compliance with state law. So I did just get a, uh, a little bit of information from our team that Ross Playground um, was completed in 2018, but the fields and courts haven't been renovated in a while um, and would benefit from energy efficient lighting and clear pathways. So one of the things I'll say is this, um, as I think people noted, we used to do, um, we used to not have very many resources. And so we ended up going park by park, only renovating the things that were at a point of disrepair. As you've been probably noticing, we've been doing a lot more sort of whole park redesign. Um, this has particularly been true in some of our climate resilient parks, like as uh, McConnell Park, which is relatively close to me, the whole thing had to be raised because of climate change. And so that required sort of everything to be, to be upgraded at the same time. Um, so let's have a conversation. But what we do do is uh, the, the first piece, and I talked about this a little bit at the, at the um, at the Capitol hearing is sort of this piece around, we look at when was the last time we touched all the components in a park? 
that's one of the first pieces. We also look at um, sort of equity and sort of the neighborhood um, and who is served by those parks and are there um, communities that um, are in particular need that are served by that park. Um, we, looked at, we look at climate resilience that obviously also plays a role and does, you know, sort of impact um, what, what, what decisions that we make. Uh, so more than willing to talk about any particular park, more than willing to do a special session um, and wanting to stop because I know you're going to run out of time just in case you have one more question. <laughs> um, no, that, thank you. Uh, Reverend Mariama, I want to thank you for, um, the, for the offer to talk more. I also want to say um, that, like, we tend to be hitting sometimes these brick walls when you mentioned BRGP. So I, I just want to know, we just want to put on the record, like, we did disparity study that allowed us to do these sheltered markets. Like, I think we need to start putting that back on the table again, um, discussions about doing disparity studies when we start to hit these brick walls. So thank you, uh, Councilor Royal, and thank you, Reverend Mario Moy-Hammond, and everyone for being on this call and for the information you provided. Thank you, Council Lujan. We uh, have Council President Flynn, uh, followed by Council, uh, Councilor Coletta. So, Councilor Flynn, floor is yours. Thank you, Council Royo. Um, wanted to focus on a couple issues in my park and want to say thank you to Commissioner Woods, too, for his support. Uh, Moakley Park, Moakley Park in South Boston. Um, surrounded, literally surrounded by three public housing developments. Um, Reverend, uh, Reverend Hammond, can you tell me uh, what's the latest on this park and um, where we currently stand? Yes, so that we have really good news to report. Um, we have an additional, and I wanna make sure I got this number right, $50 million, correct? Am I right with that for Moakley? Approximately, might be 47. Anyway. That's the total. Okay. Um, so we have um, some significant resources to move on phase one of, of Moakley Park, um, which will mean going into greater depth around design, starting to get all those engineering pieces together. Um, and we'll be focusing on some of the climate resilience pieces um, to get moving. And we're also, I do want to know, um, really excited with the new state administration and, and already have had some early conversations with them about how we um, work more collaboratively to address places where um, climate issues are hitting both of our uh, uh, adjacent properties. So Moakley, as you know, is right up against Carson Beach and, um, and some of the land that is managed by DCR. It sort of goes back and forth between DCR and the city and DC, you know, so we're all uh, intertwined on uh, the state police. Uh, barracks there. So we're excited. We have some real resources to get started um, and hope that uh, you will be part of this process as we figure out how we move into this next phase. We know you've been active previously and um, many people know that Moakley is also one of my local parks. Um, it's where I spend a lot of time and go running in that area um, and and look forward to really getting to, to, to dive in. It is one of our most um, most important sort of next investments in terms of climate resilience. We're also looking at Christopher Columbus Park. Um, these are two major pieces where we have flood um, paths right into the park and we need to begin addressing them um, immediately. And those are both looking um, to, to move forward in this coming year. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's a park I'm very familiar with as well. I, I played sports there and I go down to see my son play baseball there. And I'm probably down there several times several times a week. Um, I also want to acknowledge Senator Collins and Representative Beal for their work working with um, state legislators in the DCR too. Um, let me let me go on to let me go on to Chinatown. I know you you highlighted the potential for some funding for a, um, a park, maybe over the over the over um, the, the the highway system, um, connecting maybe Chinatown in the south end. What's what's the status on that, or is there any any update on what you're thinking on that? Yeah, so we have received um, we received a federal grant called um, 
reconnecting communities and that will pay for a design phase. So it'll allow us to really look at what is feasible, what will it, what will the, some of, you know, early cost estimates to be and to, to be able to sit down with the community and look at what we might um, do there. So that um, is moving from a hypothetical to something that could be very real. And so we'll get started on feasibility and design. And then there's another grant that you can also apply for that helps to pay for um, the actual implementation. So uh, we'll start with that feasibility and design and then go from there. It's not the only place we can consider for park in, in um, Chinatown. Obviously, the neighborhood is in severe need. Um, and so we are open and have had some outreach from community about other possibilities, um, other places where we could be supportive. So Josiah Quincy School, could we get more trees there? So there have been a variety of conversations about what we can do in Chinatown. But um, we are really thankful that we received that federal grant and look forward to uh, moving forward in the design phase for that. I think Chinatown has the smallest park in the city, Tai Tong Village Park. Um, and, it's, and it's used by so many families too. I, I'm over there at least two or three days a week um, as well. But having the smallest park in the city, having almost limited space for um, kids to play. I'm, I'm working with the state and with um, city officials on Reggie Wong basketball court. I know Ryan Woods is, was part of it and, and Chris Cook as well was at the Greenway. Um, but that would be a great partnership. Reggie Wong Park, which has volleyball and basketball. It's, it's in the middle of the, the leather district and in Chinatown. But I want to see that become a, a park that we can be proud of. I'm not proud of that right now. It's state property. Yep. And the well, residents of Chinatown and the Leather District deserve something beautiful, just like the residents of, 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 of Back Bay do. So, um, you know, I, I think that also has to be has to be a priority. So we are we are supporting that. We know what residents are pushing for, and it has real potentials in terms of recreation. I do want to note that the amount of soil underneath the area is not significant and probably wouldn't support the level of sort of trees and vegetation that we would usually want. So we do think it's an important part. And we are looking for things that m more closely could fit what we would traditionally think of as a park where you could really have trees and you could have grass and you could have different kinds of vegetation. And Reggie Wong um, has definitely served a purpose in the neighborhood and allows people to recreate, but doesn't have enough soil coverage underneath it to have the same kind of uh, vegetation that we would usually want in a, in, in a park. So, applaud it and we're going to be looking to do uh, some other yeah things. right uh, th thank you thank you reverend and I, that, that's important to me because i also represent part of part of the back bay and i love the back bay i love walking on commonwealth avenue i love i love the public garden i like the the flowers i love the trees but you know what i love more than that is i love w watching kids playing basketball at reggie reggie wong park but the kids from chinatown are not treated at the same as the kids from the back bay and that's that's unfair um again i it's i'm not blaming anyone I'm, I'm certainly not blaming the city but the kids from chinatown deserve the same level of respect that um other wealthy kids deserve have in the city of boston um let me let me let me go on let me ask one more question senior leadership for um all of your departments do you have any cantonese speaking um senior leaders no, and that is, and I'll just say within the Parks Department, um, we have n no Asian American um, staff and that's of, of particular concern. Um, so there are a number of places and what, as I mentioned earlier, that the, our first piece is to make sure that everybody was aware of where we were struggling. So um, we, we don't have, um, there's not significant Asian American and not commensurate with the number of Asian American population in the city, in the parks department. There are um, a significant amount of um, black Americans. However, um, 
we have a major inequity in terms of leadership positions, in terms of the amount of dollars that people are being paid, there's a great a level of inequity there. Um, and the other do you, big- Do you, do you have any, besides senior staff, do you have anyone that speaks Cantonese? I'm not, not that I know of. Allison, do we have anyone in the we, environment department? We have several Mandarin speakers, and I think we have one person who speaks a little bit of Cantonese, but not fluent. Um, but we have several Mandarin speakers. Yeah, the, the, the people, mostly the people in Chinatown, they speak Cantonese. Um, so we work China with LCA uh, to bring in interpreters. We do have multiple meetings that we've had, both in parks and in environment, where we bring in um, LCA to have uh, Cantonese interpretation, but not within, um, not on the team. I, I met with Jennifer this morning from Language and Communication Access. Um, but the interpretation services are not the same as having a full-time staff person that speaks the language fluently. Um, so when, when you come back again during the budget season, like we are doing now, I'm sure you'll come back again. Could you give me another update on um, if there has been any outreach to anyone to try to recruit some people that speak Cantonese? We can have, yeah, we can have a conversation. I, I'm going to be transparent that right now, um, that hadn't been a core component of what we were tracking. We do ask people and talk about how we appreciate, but right, right now we haven't had specific outreach around language, not just this language, but in any languages. Um, it's been mostly overall racial diversity um, and in parks, particularly uh, gender diversity within the maintenance team. Um, but I'm, I would love to engage and, and figure out where we could um, add another layer of, of look at uh, language diversity. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure my constituents, the majority of them in District 2 speak Cantonese. No, no, not a majority of them. A good percentage of them speak Cantonese. I just want to make sure that they are represented in city government too. Um, so let me ask one more question. Um, Food access, did I hear you guys are level funded? Yes, food justice, yes. Food justice. That's because why are, they had, level, why are they? We had a significant increase last year. And one of the big challenges has been um, over this last year, we've done a major restructuring, put and, and added the jobs that we got some resources for last year. But it made sense to actually onboard those folks, get everything set and start moving before asking for more uh, resources. So. That has been the huge challenge this last year. Uh, okay. Um, thank you to the administration team and um, thank you, Council Royal. Thank you, uh, Councilor Coletta. And it'll then be Michael Flaherty, Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Coletta, the closures. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for that presentation. Uh, it, was, it was very thorough and I've um, been in deep partnership and conversation with a lot of folks on this call. So, um, I do wanna start it just in gratitude to everybody here for their work, food, food access, um, Elisa, Reverend Mary Emma White Hammond, um, Commissioner Woods, you are so incredibly responsive. Everybody is responsive when we have issues in, in the community. I just wanna give a shout out to some of the parks employees that work within my district, Leo Boucher, Luchanka, um, uh, Jack Shavink. These are some of the unsung heroes of, our, uh, of the team. I also wanna give a shout out to Kat McClandless, McClandless. I don't know if I said her name right, but McCandless, but yes, McCandless. Yep, uh, her her team at at Climate um, Ready Boston has just been incredible. So, um, thank you all for your work and for um, for keeping me in the loop on, on a lot of these issues already. Um, you all have been busy with Birdo tree tree access or not tree access, excuse me, food access and and tree expansion and and parks and open space, obviously, but. Um, I'm really excited to see the addition of the FTEs with the tree canopy and bringing some of that work in house. Um, that was going to be a, a priority of mine in this budget if it wasn't already in there. Um, but I know that you're already in partnership with Bill Masterson and Tree Eastie and some other folks to expand that um, and, and lean on community partners to, to help you out in this work. Um, no surprise, my question is, is around climate resiliency in the city of Boston. And as we sunset climate ready phase two, um, it just wrapped up in East Boston and Charlestown. And we're looking to this new phase of implementation, I think is what somebody had said. 
um, and partnering with the Parks Department and the BPDA on the uh, Coastal Resiliency Task Force. I'm just wondering um, what that what that looks like in your mind operationally. Like, are we losing any of our climate ready folks? Are they transitioning to that role? Um, are we hiring more more people? If, if somebody could just uh, elaborate on that, I, I would appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. No, we're not losing anyone. Um, and we've been working with the BPDA over the last few months to really look at what that looks like operationally, um, have had some conversations with our teams, worked out sort of where there's a, obviously a lot of restructuring happening at the BPDA as they move into the city roles and clarify sort of who's where. Um, so yeah, it will be a deep, deep collaboration um, between our cabinet and the BPDA. Um, part of, and also there's been a pretty important role played by uh, Chris Osgood in the work that he's been doing around infrastructure. He's been helping to sort of convene and really look at what are all the different kinds of projects that need to happen? What are the projects that are on public land? What are the projects that are on private land? How do we sort of pull all of those different pieces together? Because we've got to close flood paths and the flood paths don't really go, oh, this is public land, I'm gonna flow here, but this is private land, I'm gonna say, like it doesn't work like that. And so we've been trying um, to think about how we have a comprehensive approach that really closes the flood path, as you also know, but uh, maybe not at all of the council, co council colleagues know, um, we're also in a pretty deep conversation with the Army Corps, um, which we're really excited to participate in. And um, really, um, we're trying to bring um, maybe a different, we're trying to partner with them on an approach that's a little different than what they have traditionally done in a, in a lot of other parts of the country. Um, there has been a tendency to just build seawalls and we're not saying that there will never be a seawall needed. There are some places where that's probably the only real option that we have in the sense that we built very close up to the water and there's not a lot of leeway to work with. Um, but uh, we, We've taken a pretty strong stance around climate, uh, nature-based solutions and really leaning in there. And so we want to do that as much as possible. Um, and that, that's something we've been very, very, very clear with the core about from the very beginning and are thankful that in this partnership, we're continuing to negotiate from different uh, approaches and stances to hopefully get to a place where we can be on the same, on the same page. So yeah, that's where we are. And we have gotten to the point of like, doing a, a, a bit of a, you know, I think trying to do a bit of a mocha analysis, who's going to manage, who's going to own it, who's going to, you know, what are the pieces that everybody's going to do and whose roles are going to, um, who's going to play which role so that we all are on the same page and we are, are, are in a, agreement about how we move pieces forward. Uh, yeah. Thank but you I for that. You will, we, we have already agreed that a good chunk of the community engagement piece it's not the only thing we'll do, but it's th that we that we think we've built some some goodwill in the community around these conversations and want to help that to lead this this next phase. Well, that's a, that's what I was going to say. I mean, anything, any next steps that take place with this Coastal Resiliency Task Force, I want your office to be at the center because your team has the expertise in these nature-based solutions. You're working with Stone Living Lab. You're working with some of our academic partners. So I, I was worried that we were going to be losing some of these incredible folks. So if, if you're saying no, then then I'm I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, we, we hope that their voices will be even more elevated in this, in the way that um, these teams come together. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, tree, tree canopy stuff in East Boston. Uh, one specific question. Uh, can we get those tree pits approved on Meridian Street? Yeah, I think there's a complexity to it, Councillor, because it's, it's an excavation permit where they're excavating into a place where tree pits don't exist. And the contractor that tree needs to using is not the current person that's bonded and has the contract with the city. So then there's a liability to take on. So it's the complexity of figuring out, even though this contracting company was with the city before, they currently don't have the contract for liability. So finding out if Tree East is gonna to move to a different contractor that has that liability or ways that we could have something written up that the current contractor they're working with will take on liability that they hit anything when they're digging into the, uh, doing the excavation work on the sidewalks. Okay, thank you for that clarification. If we can talk offline about this. I mean, Tree East is, is doing incredible work and they're just trying to expand our canopy as best as we can. This is one of those barriers, right? It's the liability and bonding and all of that. Just, we just wanna plant some trees, you know what I mean? So how can we make this easier for some of our partners? I know that's something that you all are looking at, um, which is great, but just thank you for your work. I don't have any other questions, but 
um, grateful for you all and, and, and thank you again. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Councillor Flaherty, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming in clear. Councillor Arroyo, did you call on me? No, yes. I'm just coming back no. around. Councillor Flaherty. Thank Most you very much. Uh, you. Thank you to, to everyone from, from Park. <laughs> One of my concerns uh, is I see that the, obviously, uh, you know, the need, obviously, to, to put a shoulder into um, climate resiliency, tree canopy, all the issues that we've been talking about uh, and having hearings on, plus our responsibility to the residents, to the taxpayers, to families, to our youth, to make sure that our parks and playgrounds and ball fields are in pristine uh, condition and can compete uh, with some of our surrounding suburban communities, um, particularly the playing fields. But um, I noticed once again, and this has been uh, an issue that I've struggled with uh, during my tenure on the council is that our overall budget is, is, is still under 1%. And I'd like to maybe see in a re resubmission a, a, a higher number than that uh, to give um, you know appropriate resources uh, to all of you to, uh, to carry out you know, your function you know, as chief and as commissioner and, and all the other uh, folks that are here from Park. So I guess the first question is why, why is it once again so low? Um, we haven't even cracked 1%. And uh, second piece is around um, the maintenance crew. I, uh, that's one of the biggest complaints we get, and I get this as an at-large council. I mean, we're way behind in tree pruning, uh, way, way, way behind. So uh, we need to stop talking about increasing our capacity to prune trees and, um, and put people there that, um, that can work with the arborist and prune trees. Um, I know short term, I know we've, we've subsidized, we've privatized it, we've, we've farmed it out, but we have the capacity uh, to do it ourselves. And then also on our Hokies, we've always asked for additional Hokies to, to keep our, uh, our and, and, and uh, keep our, our streets and our parks clean, but they're not able to use lawn mowers and, um, and weed whackers and stuff like that. So, and I don't know whether or not if, it, if, if my memory serves me correct, I thought, I think there may be a, a collective bargaining or maybe a civil service or a labor issue with that. So. Uh, are we going to address that so that when we do hire folks and no matter what gender and color they are, uh, if they're providing a service and a function for the parks department that they're actually able to carry out uh, functions, which is uh, mowing and pruning and, and, and weed whacking and striping, et cetera. Uh, we run into this problem where we'll make some hires, but they don't have the ability to carry out these very important necessary functions. So those are sort of my questions. Uh, recap, why is the budget so low with all the things that we have to do? And um, around uh, maintenance, why haven't we increased the number of maintenance uh, professionals, particularly in the tree pruning, uh, and also fixing up our parks and playgrounds and our ball fields? And then lastly, when we do make hires, how come some folks can use the machines? How come some can't? Some can mow, some are unable to because of, um, uh, because I guess, of either civil service or their labor requirements. Those issues have to be ironed out so that when we do make a hire, um, and I'm sure that we've got a lot of vacancies uh, in, in your department as well as other departments. I think we've got somewhere over close to 1,800 uh, open jobs in the city of Boston, which has never happened in my 20 years here. So uh, let's focus on putting people to work um, and making sure that they're able to use the equipment um, in, in the maintenance facility so that we can get uh, and put a shoulder into what, what these issues. And that's why our phone calls, that's why our phones ring from constituents across the city concerned about you know, the quality of our fields and parks and what have you. So that's. That's it in a nutshell, um, and I'll, uh, I'll wait for responses. Thank you all for your time and attention and for uh, all the effort that you bring to uh, for our parks in the city. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the why is so, so low question. I will say this, we have gotten more resources last year and again this year. Um, and you are naming some areas where we could do more. So in terms of the tree pruning, um, we have grown the tree division um, pretty significantly from two to three people to 16. So those positions exist. Um, that is a place where we're hiring all of our arborists. We hired a director of urban forestry who started in, in the February. We've had fired three arborists. Those folks have started. And now we are in the process of hiring our TEOLs, tree equipment um, operator laborers, and our four persons 
um, to, to sort of move those crews. crews. Once those are fully hired, our capacity for tree cr pruning will be pretty um, uh, expanded from what it once was. In the interim, we were using ARPA funds to hire outside contractors to bring some of that wait list down so that the crews don't start um, completely snowed by a like total backlog. So on that particular issue, we are moving forward. Um, on the issues of ball fields and what other folks have sh shared, general maintenance of parks, that is not an area that we have yet experienced any growth in this upcoming budget. So if we had more maintenance folks, we could certainly um, put them to use. Right now, we are just trying to figure out how we use the positions we have and move them um, equitably to make sure that everywhere in the city gets the level of coverage that it needs. And we um, welcome counselors to list, let us know in places where folks are um, feel like we need to do more. And were we to have more maintenance workers, we could also do sort of more than what we are currently able to do. Um, but we are trying to be creative with the resources we do have. And so to your point about um, sort of laborers who sometimes can or can't do different things, I wanna lift up a creative solution that the team put forward this year, which is without getting too technical, we have an entry level job that's called laborer. And then there's a next step up for that that's called an MEOL, a motor equipment operating laborer. And that allows you to use a lot more of the equipment. Straight laborers cannot drive trucks. They cannot um, use some of the equipment technically in their, um, in their, it, that we use to do a lot of our park maintenance. And so what we have found is that we didn't fully get it, but we do now, um, that there was, there is a provision in um, the previous collective, collective bargaining agreement that allows us to, to move those folks along. And we have budgeted in this year's budget to make sure that we can upgrade everyone that is eligible to be an MEOL into that role um, so that they have more capacity and they're able to do all of the pieces that they wanna do. Um, I wanna lift up the fact that a lot of our folks do what they have to do even when sometimes the rules are not perfect um, and don't always facilitate, uh, but, but we are both um, using uh, the tools that are at our disposal that we maybe hadn't accessed before. And we also know that collective bargaining begins again um, imminently. And we're having some conversations about other things that we should be doing to modernize how um, our teams work together and make sure that everybody is able to pitch in and we're able to do things um, more as effectively and efficiently as possible. Sometimes we just need more hands on the plow. And then I will say the, the last thing that we're doing um, is really looking at training um, to make sure that we as quickly as possible are getting, helping people to access all the skills that they can to be able to do the different pieces of the work. As we, decide, um, as we design more climate um, resilient parks, we're also adding features that we did not have 10, 15, 20 years ago. We need to make sure that all of our um, maintenance team is trained and, and know what they need to do in order to be able to do those. So, um, we are trying to use our resources as effectively as we possibly can. If we had some more, we would add more folks in the in, in the maintenance department. Uh, in, in chief, let me uh, offer a piece piece of a suggestion. I should say, in chief uh, Yasha Franklin Hodge probably would benefit from this. Speaking as a former teamster, and I know that we had a CDL program. It's very inconsistent. Uh, you can't depend on it when folks call. Um, they don't have regular classes. From an interdepartment uh, situation, from parks to public works to transportation, there actually may be a couple other departments. We should have a system whereby folks can get a hoisting license, they can get a CDL, which is also known as a commercial driver's license, uh, and they also have the ability to learn and to be licensed to operate heavy equipment. That should be sort of a, a, a pro forma uh, within our city so that whether you're working for the parks department and you want to work towards promotion and upward trajectory, whether you work for public works, whether you work for uh, for the transportation department, uh, all of those licenses and or certificates are required as you move up the ladder. And we, as a city, we missed the boat on that. Uh, we should partner with the Teamsters because that's what they do and they do an excellent job at it. Uh, they have their own training facilities uh, and we should be, when, when folks get these entry level jobs, we should put them on a path uh, to get these uh, the necessary next step licenses so that they can compete uh, for uh, better jobs and supervisory positions and better wages, et cetera. So we missed the boat on that. 
um, arguably because a lot of it's seasonal and you have the seasonal employees and then they have to take a little bit of a TV timeout before they can get off at another seasonal position. We might want to start to transition off of those um, portions of it and allow folks that are doing a seasonal uh, to maybe go get the licenses and then continue on as a permanent full-time employee. So I, I know the seasonal portion of it benefits the city uh, from season to season, but I think we miss an opportunity to train uh, the men and women of the, of the department and allow them to gain sort of, I guess, full-time opportunity. So I'll leave that at that and uh, happy to partner with you, happy to make the introductions over uh, to the teams that, that do the CDLs and do the hoisting and do the heavy equipment stuff. But no reason why our three departments, parks, public works, and transportation should not sort of have a concerted um, you know, uh, plan to, you know, to, to continue to train uh, the men and women of these departments so that they can get these licenses and move forward. And, and then just lastly, if you can just touch on the, on the tree pruning, we're, we're way, 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 way behind. That's one of the big calls I get. Uh, I get them year round, but particularly as the, as the warm weather now, uh, what, you know, if someone calls my office tomorrow and says, Hey, I need a tree prune. I, what's the best thing I can tell them a couple of years? Like, wh like, where are we? I, I need to, I need some. I need to be able to manage expectations when people call, when they have a tree that's um, you know protruding their their uh, foundation in their basement or rubbing up upside their house and causing damage to the side of their property uh, and or causing a dangerous situation on a view corridor. I need to be able to tell them that we can get to it in 24, 48 hours. We're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, where are we? So two things I'll say. One. Um Everything that you said about labor, we are in that conversation. Would love to give you more detail. No, we don't have enough time here. Uh, on the tree pruning side, I'll say there's two pieces. One, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Woods to say we have actually seen some um, improvement in sort of where we are in terms of pruning. But I do want to note, and this is something he just for all counselors, just as people call, there are times when people are calling about tree issues that are not actually um, city trees. So I wanna make that distinction is to, to sort of check in with people if the tree that they're talking about is actually a street tree, then yes, we need to do better. We can talk about where we are. And we also find that sometimes people call us about anything related to trees and we only do the street trees. So, uh, but let's, we can talk about the street trees, but I just wanted to because we do have some confusion there often in the community. Um, Commissioner Woods, did you have the um, data around where we are, um, uh, where we are in terms of pruning? So currently, when a constituent calls in with a tree request, an arborist gets sent out, it, uh, and the queue is up to three months. Current. It was up to three months for the arborist to go out and inspect that request for pruning. Once the arborist then says yes, it does need to be pruned in these areas, they put in the work order queue for the contractors, which could take another you know, six, seven months for them to get out there, which is ridiculous. So what we've done is using the ARPA funds, as the chief mentioned, we're trying to get to a man more manageable place. So the whole issue would be, you know, taken care of, uh, you know, within a couple months, instead of it taking almost a year um, to get them down. And with the, having the staff in house uh, and now having three arborists that are going out to do these inspections instead of one person, uh, we are gonna reduce this wait time tremendously. So it is a work in progress but currently uh, it's about a year when somebody at requests a tree that is not an emergency hazard. If it's an emergency hazard, it goes right to the front of the list and gets taken care of immediately. That'd be great. Thank you, Commissioner. It's great to work with you as it is the Chief. Thank you, Chief, and uh, thank you to the Chairman. And just to ask if there's a resubmission that you uh, add, add some funds, uh, you know, while we have them. Uh, we support your efforts, uh, and it's an important piece of our overall budget. And uh, once again, like 20 years, 10 years, it's sad to see that you're under 1%. I'd like to see a bigger number. So thank you. I also all. want Appreciate to note. Commissioner Woods uh, told me that I misspoke. We did not get the funding for the MEOL. So okay. that is something that we submitted and would want to see. It's about, I think, $35,000 to make it possible for all of our frontline staff to be able to get that small bump for being able to work with that equipment. Well, I would, su I would support that. And if we could get in the resubmission through through the chair and or to the chair ways and means when she uh, gets back to, uh, to dealing with it, it'd be great. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, Councillor Braden, uh, it is your turn, and then I'll go for a second round all the way around. If you are a councillor and you have a second round of questions, please raise your Zoom hand so that I can go in order that way instead of calling through every single person. Uh, just raise your hand and, and let me know that you have a second round of questions. Councillor Braden, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, a few things. Um, I, I think one thing uh, we, we greatly appreciate the incredible urgency and uh, demand of you know rising sea level and uh, the uh, impacts of climate change along the shore. Um, I always say that Alston Brighton is further inland. We're we're not unlikely to see seawater in our neighbourhood, but. Uh, we, as we saw recently with Fort Lauderdale, we're, we're going to see increasing um, extreme weather events that drop a lot of precipitation on the neighbourhoods uh, and cause inland flooding. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I know this is probably a Boston Water and Sewer issue, but uh, we also need to address things like permeable uh, pavers and, and make sure that um, we are not paving over our backyards and that we have trying to make permeable surfaces that will absorb as much water as possible. Um, and I don't know if, if we're, we're actually f addressing that. And I apologize, I was late coming to the meeting. I had a, a double header this afternoon. Um, you know, in, in terms of permeable um, stormwater infrastructure like swales and, and rain gardens and permeable surfaces, what we're doing in that area. And then the other question was just really um, the tree canopy, like one of the areas that's a hot zone in, in, in the city is, is Alston. Uh, it's pretty much very much denuded of trees in, in, in large parts of the, that part of the neighborhood. Uh, incredible heat island effects in the summer and I, I was wondering where we are in terming strategically uh, working on tree planting. Uh, I know there's lots, lots of voluntary efforts on private individuals and nonprofits trying to work in this space, but what, what support we have to try and increase the tree canopy in Alston. And then the other issue was really just outreach in terms of the, the mass save program for uh, low income households and renters. Uh, it seems that, you know, I've been a great beneficiary of the Mass Save program, um, but I know so many other folks haven't, and how can we uplift that to make it more accessible to people? Uh, and then one more other one concern I had that I wanted to uplift was just the whole issue about the, the Boston community. Um, choice for electricity is fabulous, um, but we, are, we hear every day about the um, aggressive uh, predatory scams that are, are perpetrated on our seniors and folks who do not speak English and I just wanted to check in on where we're at with that and and do we have any any tools in the kit to try and um, remediate that situation I'm sorry that was three four questions and uh, I won't be here for a second round so um, I hope I can get some answers uh, and then I know we talk about parks in the neighborhood uh, McKinney Park is across the street from um, the Faneuil Gardens uh, public housing, and uh, we'd really like to see see uh, that move forward uh, expeditiously. And also, the other area in the middle of the Heat Island is uh, the Ringer Park in Alston. Uh, it's been under study for many years, and we'd, re we'd really like to see some some movement forward. And I know I can have these conversations offline, but I just want to put those down as uh, as priorities. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to move through sort of quickly. Um, in terms of permeable surfaces, that's one of the um, real pieces that we're looking at in terms of our parks being a major source of impermeable or permeable surfaces. But there's also, um, it would be worth talking with the streets cabinet, Kate England, the director of um, green infrastructure, and, and she is doing a lot of coordination with Boston um, Water and Sewer around how we increase uh, impermeable or permeable surfaces, sorry, not how we remove impermeable surfaces from around the city um, and really trying to get more and more people to be aware of that, really work with folks to make that um, something that people even understand. Because I think a lot of times people don't even understand what it means to pave your backyard. I've been in a little bit of a struggle here with my own um, condo association about like not paving over our own backyard. Um, so it is what it is. Um, but that's the, that's the other resource I think that um, it would be good to have a, a deeper conversation with Kate England about some of the things that are going on um, beyond our the lands that we own as a city. Um, in terms of Austin trees, definitely still in the conversation. I know that you raised this in the, in the conversation around the urban tree canopy. We, in this next coming year, will begin um, working on neighborhood plans. We are, I mean, the question is about sequencing and how deeply and how many 
neighborhoods we can engage all at the same time. So I'm not gonna promise that we're gonna engage every neighborhood all at the same time. Probably gonna do two to three, um, learn from that, and then do to two to three the, the following year, just so that we really actually can do a good um, community process, but more than interested in, ha in continuing the conversation around where that might um, lead us. Um, in terms of CCE and competitive electric supply, a lot of our work has been um, advocating at the state house around what can happen in terms of competitive electric supply because there's just some real limitations to what we can do. Um, we will hear that they do something, we report them to the AG's office or we get residents when residents do call the CCE line um, to tell us about what they're being charged by competitive electric suppliers. We are ready to, to um, direct them to the AG's office to make those reports and we do follow up and have conversations with the AG's office about what they're getting in. It is worth noting though that the governor in her previous role at the AG's office tried to do a, a number of things around this and so we anticipate that we having someone who has been more tuned into this issue will allow some new things to move forward at the state level. Um, but most of what we're doing right now is just making sure we get the word out there. We're thankful because a number of counselors, once you learned about it, we've heard that you've been taking that message out in the community. Thank you for helping us do that. And we think that we need something with more teeth, but that that piece around having more teeth to push back on them is mostly a state uh, function. And we've been raising our voice pretty loudly um, at the state house to make sure educating legislators who are having particular concerns in their communities um, within the, the Boston delegation. And then um, McKinney Park, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Kathy really quickly to let us know where we are with those two parks. And I think then we will have answered. Yeah, we're going to be, um... As soon as we get a project manager on board, uh, we're gonna be reassigning McKinney Park so that that can move forward uh, pretty quickly. I think there's a lot of exciting uh, things to happen there. And Ringer Park should be uh, starting the community process this summer. Um, so as soon as we get that contract back, we can, we can begin uh, reaching out to the community and, and trying to set up those conversations about phase one. I do just wanna also mention that, um, that Kate England has been really great. We've been working with her pretty closely um, one of the challenges that we have is around um, not having the equipment that's required to do some of the pervious paving and maintain it to the level. Um, and she's really been instrumental in trying to get that um, going from a citywide perspective to make sure that, that we have all of the, uh, that we can maintain these, these uh, green infrastructure once we put it in. So she's been really supportive of our efforts to expand that as well. Thank you. And, and just one more question. I, I know that um, the Chandler Pond project is, is sort of uh, going f forward bit by bit. Um, I, I don't know if this, um, where we're at with that in terms of, um, I know we had CPA money, we have state money, we've, we've got different pieces. It's, it's a little gem of a park. It's not little actually, but it's a, it's a passive green space and it's not a ball field and it's incredibly well used and uh, we have migratory birds coming through. It's, it's just a fabulous 20, three, 365 days a year, it's well used. Yeah. So, um, you know, any, any help that we could get uh, to have, to sort of get that project move forward. We have some money and we're just limping forward one piece at a time. And I do appreciate all the great work that, that, you, that we've put into this to try and get it moving, but uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> Yeah, we, it is uh, primarily funded through CPA and some other grants that the friends have been uh, able to secure. We are supporting it from an operational perspective, and we're going to be um, we're going to be bidding it. It's going out to to ConCom this month, um, so we're we're making some progress on it and uh, and trying to get that out to bid as soon as possible. It is worth noting overall that in this budget we do have the resources for three additional. Um, project managers, senior project managers, which should make a difference. I know many counselors are concerned about parks that you got allocated, but we haven't actually sent them to design. And that's in part because we just don't have enough people to assign them to. So that should relieve some of that pressure. Yeah. And I do, I do really want to thank you all. The parks department are doing some incredible work. And, uh, you know, as we, as we deal with climate change, uh, parks are going to be a critical piece of our infrastructure for our health and well-being and, and also just the livability of the city so thank you all for your wonderful work and i'm sorry i can't stay for the rest of the hearing i have another engagement but uh, thanks again thank you mr chair thank you councillor braden uh councillor mejia uh thank you chair um i just have a few questions for the chief um in regards to community engagement i know a few years ago um 
we had an encounter, this was before your time, Chief, a series of small businesses that had experienced flooding right on Columbia Road. And we started doing some organizing and some, you know, public education around the environment so that these smaller immigrant owned businesses can see the connection between climate, the environment, and the issues that they were dealing with as small businesses. And I'm just curious from an engagement standpoint, you know, what are we doing? Um, and what could we be doing more of with additional resources, obviously, to help bring in some more of these non-traditional uh, voices um, and constituents into the climate justice conversation? Yeah, so I, I think there's a, sort of two, two groups that you're mentioning. One is um, our small businesses that are below the Berto threshold, um, but they are experiencing flooding, for instance, or another thing that we're hearing from people is much higher um, energy costs that are really, really taxing our small businesses. So we do have a position within the Berto team. And so it's actually really the buildings and de building decarbonization team. Um, Ber Berto is just one component of it. Um, but we have a uh, one role that is particularly focused on helping people to actually access mass save because it's one thing to have the resources there but then there's many times where people don't know that the resources are available to them so they don't they don't tap into them and what actually ends up happening is that the disproportionate everybody is paying on their electricity bill everybody's paying on their their heating bill for the mass save program but what has been happening and it's been documented through you know data is overwhelmingly the commercial people that are paying in the money's being spent on the big building not the small um, uh, small businesses that are paying into it, but not really receiving enough of it. Again, renters are paying into this, but overwhelmingly the money is going to homeowners and particularly homeowners outside of the city. So one of the things that we did around that is to create a role within the city in a partnership with Mass Save to make sure that our people get their fair share. And they, they should get that. And they're not going to get it unless somebody's actually out there talking to them. And so part of what we're doing is helping to make some of those connections. Um, but I think we could be doing that also around issues of flooding. We will be doing some of that as we begin the climate ready implementation and, and place any small businesses that are um, small businesses that are right along an active flood path. Um, but I, I want to be honest that to be honest with you, we're not quite hitting all of other people who are impacted by Berto. Um, and so currently our level of outreach is somewhat limited by the number of folks we have. Um, we do have people that call the Berto hotline, sometimes literally crying because they do not know what they're supposed to do. Um, if I had more resources, we'd be staffing that team up more sufficiently to make sure that we could actually help people through the process, not just telling them what they have to do, but helping them to figure out what they might actually be able to do um, to really decarbonize their building. And that is both for folks who are at Berto impacted, but also for folks who are below that threshold, but are paying the high prices that come from inefficient buildings and who are um, seeing the impacts of climate change directly on those hot days or when people are even coming into their business or all the different impacts that they're experiencing. But but right now we only have um, one person that's available for the entire city. Well, that's great. Thank you again, and thank you for being so forthcoming. Um, then I have one more question, and this is more around food justice. Um, um, during COVID, we worked to organize and to have smaller bodegas that were closer to um, residents who couldn't get to the closest food pantry, so we, we created this whole program that I believe the city has adopted to some capacity that now works with nonprofit organizations. Um, can you just give me any updates on kind of like how we are utilizing some of our um, neighborhood corner stores? I know that sometimes some are more well equipped to have healthier options and some are not so much so. So if you could just talk to me a little bit about kind of like what are we doing, A, to increase the capacity for some of these um, smaller, um, you know, local stores to have food available to them that is, you know, healthier. And then the other is, um, what, what are we doing in terms of working with these nonprofit organizations that are partnering up with these bodegas to be able to um, support 
of food insecurity issues. Is that still happening or not? So yes, with a caveat. Um, as you are very right, we made a really strong investment in the notion that local bodegas could get to people much faster. They know the people, they know the neighborhood. Um, and there are some sort of city-based ARPA dollars that we were able to mobilize. That has gone relatively well in some instances. We also, however, um, tried to access some federal funds that we could direct towards bodegas um, and corner stores. And I want to be transparent that that was a very big mixed bag um, that uh, I could hand it over to Lisa because this is a soapbox issue for her of deep concern. Um, we have not just seen this in Boston, but in talking to partners around the country, the federal dollars have been very hard to get to flow to um, smaller stores. In fact, we um, had set up a program in which some of the dollars would have gone to one of the sort of larger pieces and then a lot to smaller stores. We had smaller stores pull out of it um, in some instances because trying to help them through the process of um, being eligible for the federal funds were just more work than it was worth in some instances. Um, and because a number of other cities were also doing the same thing I think maybe we had a hope that the federal government would work with us. Um, that's not been our experience. Um, and so I think that there's a space for a lot more advocacy on what we're going to do, because if we really want to reach food insecure folks, many of them live in neighborhoods where it's not the big grocery store that's serving them, but smaller grocery stores and corner right. stores people are using. And if the federal, um, requirements can't match that reality, yep. we really risk um, losing people and losing huge opportunities. And things like, though a lot of times the smaller bodegas, they don't have as much space. So we yep. need to help people do things around refrigeration, but there were restrictions and the resources. Like, so there's there've been some real challenges. I don't know if you wanna add anything, um, Eliza, but this is actually a conversation that we've been having internally about whether or not we should find some other funds, should we give up on the federal government? Or should we talk to other places and try to organize and push? Um, but there have been some real challenges moving those resources to the places we want to go. I'll just raise my hand to say that as you continue to go through these conversations, please loop our office in because we managed to find ways to be able to support. Um, and there's ways to replicate. And I know that, um, Natalia, um, who was then um, overseeing the the efforts with the city and John Barrows back then, we did find ways to help support. It's about the long term sustainability of that. So I, you know, we have some ideas. We have some case studies. We've worked with nonprofit organizations. We worked with the city, um, but we knew it was not going to be a long term. But there is something there, Chief. If we can figure it out. I'd love to be a part of that process. So just let me know how I can be helpful. I'm just raising my hand too. Yeah, yeah, we would love to talk more. Um, and, and, and also to link with other folks because we, we do think that the shift is, that is required is not just about Boston, but if we could get, we were not the only city that tried to make that bet. And we're not the only city struggling with the challenges and um, would love to connect with you um, to figure out how we also talk to other colleagues <laughs> Figure out how we, can, we can push. Yeah, great. And um, again, I know that my time is up and I do appreciate the chair for allowing me to ask a few more questions, but um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for your, all your hard work. It's deeply appreciated. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Uh, I'm gonna ask a couple questions. I don't know if we have any other counselors who want a second round. Uh, if you do, please raise your hand. Uh, one of my questions is obviously in my district, uh, District 5, which is Rosendale, Mattapan, and Hyde Park, we get a lot, almost seemingly uh, constant requests for uh, acquisitions by our environment and park department. And I think one of the things that I would like sort of public is what is the process that we go through from a department standpoint for prioritization of how we use our limited land and acquisition dollars. 
uh, and what the vision is for how we do land acquisition. You mentioned Sprague Pond, which was a specific one within my district. But what is the what is the plan moving forward for how we look at acquisition, how the city contemplates acquisition, and what the priority is for how they go about that? So I think um, I'll share. Ryan, do you have the slide? Actually, Kevin, you might have it too. The slide we did for um, for the capital budget hearing, because I think that was a useful image to just share with folks. I don't have it pulled up right now, but I can work to get it up. All right, beautiful. So, I mean, we look at a series of factors um, and how we are uh, prioritizing things. The other thing I want to know is that the open space plan is out for public comment right now. So that just as another thing, we'll put that. Oh yeah, there's no chat. Um, well, we will email that to um, all of the counselor's offices so that you can um, take a look at that. This does, it does relate to some of the conversations we're having right now in terms of we take a comprehensive look at where is there open space? Where is there protected open space? Where is there unprotected open space? Um, and so we're looking at a variety of factors. Okay, great, Kathy, thanks. Um, so um, there's four things that we're looking at in this particular um, cycle. The first is really community priority priorities. What are people identifying? Where are there places where um, we really need to uh, lift those things up? Now, I wanna note this, that we are looking at community priorities and um, we are looking at equity because sometimes people really lift things up and we're not discounting that, but there is sometimes inequities in which communities are louder than other communities. So um, community priorities are important, um, but we also are looking at planned repairs. Um, what really has been gone a long time? It makes sense to replace things that are 15 years old before we respond to requests for things that are only four or five years old. Um, and so really looking at um, what are the life cycles of, of uh, our parks? This used to be a much more major part in terms of plan repairs when our budget was much smaller. We have a little bit more space now to make um, some more comprehensive decisions. Then climate resilience, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that Moakley and um, Christopher Columbus Park are really lifted up is because they are an active flood path that we want to be closing sooner rather than later. These are not just parks for recreation, they are also parks for protection of um, residents and neighborhoods. And so if a park is, um, is lifted up for climate resilience, we, we will elevate that. And that has traditionally been uh, around uh, sea level rise and those forms of flooding but we are also really looking at this question of climate resilience in neighborhoods where we know we have um, heat islands. And we've made a, a, a concerted effort to say that we should put um, water features in all of our parks that are in heat islands. Um, and water features are already really popular, uh, but one of the things that we got in the, in the budget this year was the money for an on-call plumbing contract because um, they all go on at the same time. And sometimes every year after the winter, something's not working, it needs to be repaired. Um, if a really hot day is coming, we need to be able to respond and make sure that all of our water features are up and working quickly. And so we now have both the plumbing folks within um, our maintenance team, but also now an on-call con contract so that if a feature goes down quickly or a couple of features go down, we have the ability um, to respond to that. Um, and then uh, the final piece is really executing these master plans. Um, we did the Franklin Park master plan. We did the Boston Common master plan. Um, we've done the urban forest plan. And so um, we have a number of different things sort of lifting up and the open space plan, lifting up uh, big recommendations about what we should be doing moving forward. And so we're looking at all of those things. The other thing is uh, worth noting, and it's worth looking at the open space um, plan, but if we have un unprotected open space that becomes available, um, that's you know, going onto the market and therefore may not become, may no longer be protected. We do look at that. And if we can afford um, to purchase and people are uh, willing to, to talk with us, those are not, that's another thing that might go into what we do in terms of acquisitions. So um, those are our sort of piece around that question. I know a couple of people had asked it, so I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. 
Thank you. That actually does. I'm glad you had a handy dandy slide for that. Uh, another question that I have is, has the department begun to make any progress on mapping air quality in our neighborhoods? Is that something that needs additional funding within this budget cycle? Uh, and is this something that can be done with the Air Pollution and Control Commission? That would be under the purview of the Air Pollution Control Commission. Um, it would take a lot. So let's talk about what it would take for that to be real. Um, because you'd, you'd really be, need to be doing it over a period of time. So we have done some work around this. We do have some air, air quality monitors. We've done some work with Monum um, in, in some particular places. For instance, um, American Legion to sort of see like, what is it? And then as you make changes, how do those changes impact the air quality in, the, in, that, in that neighborhood? It would be a lot to just have sensors everywhere and collecting data everywhere that would be um, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a good use of funds in terms of how much it would cost to do so. But I do think that if there are places where we know there's some real challenges and we want to document them, that makes sense. Or where we know there's some real challenges and we are committing to leaning in. Um, one of my frustrations is much money has been spent on research to tell us that we have bad air. Very little money spent improving that air. And so from my perspective, I want to document it when we are committed to making sure we do something about it. Because telling people that their air is terrible when they kind of already know that, and then being like, and now that we've documented, that's all the money we have, we do not want to get in that position. And that has been a bit of the dynamic nationally. So I'm definitely open to it. We do have some capacity around it. And we only want to document um, when we have a real commitment to take action. Perfect, that's very helpful. Uh, I'll probably have a number of questions that I might ask offline or, or in a different forum. Uh, Councilor Murphy, I see that your hand is up, so I wanna give you a chance to do essentially your first round, and then I'm yeah. gonna go through uh, public comments. So the uh, floor is yours, Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Chair Arroyo, and thank you everyone for your presentation up and listening closely. I do just want to take one minute to um, echo what Councilor Flaherty said and also advocate for 1% in the capital budget. And you, um, Reverend, had just talked about also the, the big part isn't just new parks. Um, it's also repairing the ones we have and the climate re resiliency and also the master plans that we're looking at for some great um, you know, future plans we have for our parks department. So I just wanted to go on record to support that also, and we'll be advocating to increase that in our capital budget, knowing how important our parks are to our city residents. So thank you for that. That's all, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, I wanna thank the administration for a really in-depth uh, presentation and for answering everybody's questions. Um, I'm gonna go to our public comment section um, I do believe we have a significant amount of uh, folks signed up for the uh, public comment on these departments. Uh, so I'd like to do that in order of arrival and by who is here and present. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with, uh, I believe Lisa Beatman is first. Uh, because we have so many folks signed up for public testimony, I am going to stick to uh, a two minute uh, time limit, uh, which means I will mute you, unfortunately, while you're still speaking. If you go past two minutes, if you're finishing a sentence, I'm going to let you finish that sentence. Uh, but please try to be conscious of how much time uh, you have on your clock so that we can get through this so that everybody can be heard. Uh, we're going to start with Lisa Beatman. I can't hear her. Can... Okay. Oh, she's unmuted. So, so if she's ready to begin. There we go. I think she's connected to audio now. Ms. Beaton, okay. if you're ready. So I think you can, you can hear me now, right? Yep, you're coming in through clear. Okay, awesome. Since I'm the first um, of many, I will keep this really, really brief. And um, I am uh, 
well, I'm appreciative for the opportunity to speak um, and um, for all of the community engagement. Um, I am a supporter of everything that uh, the Environment and Parks Department are doing. Um, I'm uh, focusing myself um, mostly on climate resilience issues and um, protecting the diminishing uh, natural green infrastructure assets that still remain in Boston, um, including uh, Crane Ledge Woods. My particular question that I would appreciate some response to is um, there is ARPA, like there, there is or was room in ARPA to, uh, for land acquisition um, and, um, but there are also, it, it, I have seen many um, in the news a lot, many other sources of federal and state and you know, private foundation funding that would greatly augment the city's uh, capacity, uh, financial capacity uh, to do far more than, um, you know, just what is uh, able to be in, for example, the uh, land acquisition line item um, for 10 million um, that's currently proposed. Uh, so what is the city, what has the city been doing to tap into those wonderful um, kind of matching resources um, uh, particularly from federal, um, and what is the city planning to do uh, in that regard? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I believe we next have uh, Mr. Lee. Hello, everyone. My name is Jean Lee, and I am part of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. Um, thank you, Chief Mary Emma White Hammond. Commissioner Ryan Woods and the members of the city council and all the parks and rec maintenance team for your continuous work for the city. I want to echo Councillor Michael Flaherty and Councillor Aaron Murphy about the city of Boston's um, proposed fiscal year 2024 operation budget, um, which is total of $4.28 billion and the parks and recreation department operation budget is uh, roughly around 34 million, which is about 0.73% of the city's total operation budget. While we are pleased to see the continuous investment in our city's open space, the Park and Recreation Department's operation budget is still less than 1% of the city's total operation budget. This is insufficient to support the maintenance and improvement of our green spaces and to ensure the countless ecological and social benefits reach those most vulnerable, we urge you to increase the Parks and Rec depart Department budget to equal to or be greater than 1%. Examples of other cities include San Francisco that spends 1.6% of its operating budgets on parks, Los Angeles spends 2.6%, Chicago spends 4.3%, and Minneapolis spends 5.3%. So I just wanna echo again what Councillor Michael Flaherty and Councillor Aaron Murphy has suggested to increase the parks budget by at least equal to or greater than 1%. So I thank you again for this time to speak and thank you for your, all your continuous work. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen Mani Brodek. Unmute. Unmute. I am here as well, uh, Karen Monty Brodek, president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. But June was, is here on behalf of our organization. He did such a great job. I don't know if I have more to add. I would. I want to say thank you again to the hardworking folks uh, that work uh, in the field and behind the desks and answering all the calls at the Parks Department. I know it is a nonstop job. Uh, when I do look out there and I just see how many folks are are uh, taking care of Franklin Park and I see how big it is. I wanna echo the Franklin Park Coalition's request for additional uh, field operations staff. Uh, in our letter, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy submitted, uh, we, we, uh, we suggested at least eight additional field uh, maintenance staff members and another two project managers. I'm excited to hear you have three project managers in the budget. Um, I think I did some back of the envelope probably not perfect math. 
And I think if, you know, we add in 30, 32 field operations staff, maybe we get up to close to that, that 1% and like eight project managers. Uh, Cause I, I think that this department could make great use of those resources. So uh, I look forward to ways that this budget and this city councilor with its new creative tools that you guys got a couple of years ago might be able to add additional folks. Cause I, I think that this, this team would have places to use them. Cause I think we all know parks I don't think there is a park in the city that couldn't use a little bit more. Um, so, and I, and some can definitely use even more than others. So thank you very much for your support of this department's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Freeman. Everyone. Yep. Um, oops, there we go. Um, I'll try to be brief because I hope you all received um, an email that included my full comments. So um, hitting the highlights. I love Boston Parks. And so I don't want this to sound like a list of complaints. It's more like um, a wish, a really wish list. Um, and an email does not convey tone of voice. So just please keep that in mind. Um, there are rankings like park score, trust for public land, and I know not all settings are, are comparable, but Boston has slipped, even though our funds have, uh, Reverend White Hammond pointed out, or Chief, not sure what to call you, um, pointed out the funding dollars have increased, but our relative rankings have slipped, which I found very interesting and unfortunate. So we're not in the top 10 anymore. Um, and again, not to make it competitive, I want every city to have great parks. Um, let's see, some of the areas, oh, I'll, I'll add my name to the 1% and as a goal and not as a ceiling, because as June Lee pointed out there, it's possible to even go above that, but at least let's try to achieve that and then reassess. Um, some examples, which not to repeat what's been said already, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. I had I received an email from a friend yes, yesterday, over the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday. They were in New York and they'd gone to Central Park and said, oh, it looks so nice and it's like, I'm thinking to myself, I've gone to volunteer cleanups the past three Saturdays. We've had um, one Boston day and uh, Earth Day and the Muddy River cleanup and Love Your Block. And, you know, this little old lady wants to go to a park sometime to sit, walk or sit and enjoy and not feel like, oh, I better bring a bag to pick up like it just it would it's something to aspire to and I know it won't be perfect but again just a, a feeling um our friends the park rangers are always seems like always struggling to retain staff so I put in a plug for maybe higher salaries it feels like they get trained they get skills and then they realize that, oh, they can find a better paying job. And wouldn't it be nice if that better paying job were right here? Um, and they also need some funding for horses. I don't know which budget that all fits into, but um, we have things like, I, my personal time and energy is spent largely on access, uh, pedestrian and bike, feeling friendly and welcoming. And let's see, coming near the end, Franklin Park Action Plan. I know you've heard from the coalition, Franklin Park Coalition, who did extensive analysis of the budget. And so I'll just throw my hat in with them that I trust their, uh, they have their finger on the pulse of what needs to be done and what it would take to do it. And we know the Winthrop Square money is not enough. So how do we get a road map for the city portion? I'd like to add one additional area in the access front, which is the park edges. 
Um, I think when people drive by, uh, for example, Morton Street, that does not, there's a Scarborough Pond entrance along there, but it does not look very feasible or inviting when you look at the rest of the edge. So I put that out as a challenge. And one other wish list, two other wish list items. Masonry, right near where I live, there's a stone wall overlooking Jamaica Pond. It doesn't just need mortar. There are holes, like you can see through where the missing rocks are. And uh, the Shattuck Hospital site. I know the consultants mentioned it kind of indirectly about integrating or things they can do, but it's, to me, it, we can't call it that we've done a comprehensive action plan if we don't have some plans for that site. So thank you for listening. Thank you for all you do, and I'll be quiet. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Kevin Batt. Thank you, it took me a minute to unmute myself. Uh, I'm Kevin Batt, uh, I'm a board member of the Franklin Park Coalition, um, and I thank the councilors and Chief Mariama White-Hammond and Commissioner Woods and the rest of the park staff uh, and all the work you do to try to uh, help the parks department and uh, our parks in the city. Um, I will try to be brief. Uh, we were thrilled to see the completion of the Franklin Park Action Plan recently this spring. Uh, it has some great ideas. It has some great um, methodologies for things like woodlands management, but it's still kind of like looking down at the park from 30,000 feet above. Uh, it's still any of the action that we want to take from the plan uh, will require um, a, a lot of design and, and construction contracts to be brought out. Uh, we're thrilled that there's new project management uh, in the budget to try to do some of that. But um, these, and, and we thank you for prioritizing the uh, restoration of the Overlook, which was the former site of the Elma Lewis Playhouse, so that we can try to bring performances and music back to that space. Um, but. I have to say we were a little bit disappointed with the proposed budget because like many people have said, there's not enough money for maintenance. Um, let me just mention, read a bit from the action plan, which I have here by my side, just two sentences. Um, the top community's top priority is page 422, which is implementation, is take proper care of what we have. So leaving aside any new capital projects, we need to really take care of what we have. Um, and then it goes on to say, even if no new features are introduced, level of care in the park needs to increase significantly, requires four to six times more uh, maintenance staff hours. Uh, and it goes on to recommend at least four new maintenance staff be added dedicated only to Franklin Park. Now we know that many other parks are also needing more maintenance uh, uh, attention. So to drive that point home, as uh, Councillor Flaherty and Councillor Murphy recognized, we just need more maintenance staff. And whatever that takes, uh, please, please, please try to give us more maintenance staff so that we, uh, I also joined uh, Sarah Freeman in many of these um, uh, cleanups. We brought out hundreds and hundreds of black bags of trash. Uh, we cannot always maintain that level of volunteer effort. We need trash pickup, we need mowed lawns, we need uh, snow removal, all of these things that somehow uh, the parks are not quite up to speed on. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say for, for now. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Sandy Bailey. Hi, thank you, Councillor. I'm Sandy Bailey, a res Roslindale resident, and I am also a member of the board of Franklin Park Coalition. Um, I want to echo the calls for a 1% uh, parks budget. Um, we're hearing so many 
needs um, that this, I, I just hope that it, if not this year, that we can just keep boosting it till we get there. Um, and I also just want to say that hearing uh, what's going on, the administration has put so much work in and hearing about the diversity um, initiatives that are really working and starting to work at least um, in hiring and procurement, those are such great things to hear uh, that we're making progress on. And I, I, I hope it will continue. And I'm sure it will with this administration. Uh, the city invested nearly a million dollars in three years to develop the Franklin Park Action Plan. The Franklin Park Coalition worked hard during that process to engage park users from every neighborhood around the park. The city's action plan says, Franklin Park has been subject to underinvestment for far too long and significant investment is needed now, now to protect and sustain this critical resource and beloved public space. The plan calls for projects totaling about $200 million. If we did that over 10 years, that would be 20 million each year. It's a lot. And we can't rely on the Winford Square money alone, which is in the $20 million range. It would cover only about a 10th of the projects. So while we're really pleased to see 250,000 in this year's uh, budget for Franklin Park, we still think that much more is needed to make this plan a reality, to make the capital projects a reality. Also, the plan says that a core focus is to elevate the standard of care for Franklin Park by filling the maintenance gap. And to achieve this, the plan called for new staff dedicated to Franklin Park, which there are currently none. They call for a full-time park administrator, for four new maintenance staff, an ecological restoration crew, two park rangers, and two dedicated project managers to help with rolling out the mini projects. This is about good jobs and environmental justice. So these, these priorities out of the action plan are, are in everybody's interest. We're pleased to see that three new parks department project managers are in this budget. And unfortunately, they're not dedicated to Franklin Park and none of the other new Franklin Park staff recommended are in this current budget. So with, with Franklin Park and the, and the residents of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Jamaica Plain, who turned out time and again during the three-year planning process, deserve to see the significant investments that the parks needed for so long and that the city's plan recommends. So we, we hope to work with all of you to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Ed Gaskin. Uh, good afternoon, uh, panelists and counselors. Um, so I'm speaking specifically on the food justice um, issue or topic. Um, my name is Ed Gaskin. I'm the executive director of Greater Grove Hall Main Street, and we are speaking on behalf of providing a no less than 300,000 for the Healthy Food Pantry Program, uh, HFP. There's a high correlation between people who are food insecure and people who have chronic disease. The problem is that when people who are food insecure get food from a food pantry or food bank, they get highly processed food that is often high in salt, fat, and sugar, which may address their short-term uh, hunger needs, but only further aggravates their underlying chronic disease. Um, so in partnership with Harvard Community Health Center, we're proposing a pilot for the development of food that would meet the patient's dietary needs in terms of medical, as in like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, allergens, religious and philosophical preferences. The current approach is beggars can't be choosers. You get what you get regardless of what your family's dietary needs might be. So you could be prenatal, postpartum, aging parent, it doesn't matter. You all get the same commodity canned goods. Uh, currently, there's uh, programs that pr provide produce on one end of the spectrum, or what are called medically tailored meals on the other end of the spectrum. And what we're trying to address is those in the middle who uh, aren't sick enough yet, we'd like to prevent that from needing a medically tailored meal, they can still cook, but they don't have access to the, either the condiments or the entrees that they can prepare at home. Um, this would be much more effective than waiting for them to obviously to get sick and we have to provide them an entire meal. Um, the program would be do one other thing. 
Typically, uh, the distribution of food is transaction, like you get a box of whatever, the, whatever they're giving out that week, and uh, we want to make it more into a relationship. So with every person that receives whatever the groceries are for that week, we're inviting them to participate in the consultation with a registered dietitian to figure out if we can determine other dietary needs, other medical needs that might be able to be addressed or discovered after uh, this initial consultation. Uh, and if there's any other ways that uh, we could support them. Uh, given that there's 20 uh, community health centers, basically one in everybody's district, uh, if in fact we could make this pilot work out, uh, we could be able to roll it out across the city uh, sometime in the future, perhaps next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaskin. Alexander Leventhal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, my name is Alex Leventhal and I am board president of the Friends of the Boston Park Rangers Mounted Unit. As an organization, our goal is to ensure the Boston Park Rangers can continue to enhance our city parks as welcoming guides to all visitors, provide critical wayfinding as well as educational and public safety functions. As an organization, our mandate is to raise funds and marshal public support so that the Mounted Unit can continue to patrol our nine parks of the Emerald Necklace. Our funds have supported various costs of running the mounted unit that include the acquisition of new horses, veterinary care, stable improvements, and equipment, to name a few. I would like to share some of our priorities and specific budget requests that are needed by the Boston Park Rangers to continue to effectively carry out their mission. To this end, we ask for your support in maintaining existing city support levels and funding the following budget requests. Uh, one, maintain existing funding for at least 18 full-time ranger positions. Two, increase funding for the recruitment and outreach of $4,000. The acquisition of four new horses at an estimated $6,000 per horse for a total request, request of $24,000. Maintain the existing annual equine care budget of $90,000. Five, the replacement of office trailers with a total cost of $71,000. Six, uh, $3,000 to establish a stable and corral maintenance fund. And uh, seven, lastly, $5,000 for emergency veterinary services. In closing, I wanna thank the chairman and the members of the committee for your time and consideration and look forward to working with you over the next upcoming several months. And a special thank you to Chief White Hammond, Commissioner Woods and Deputy Commissioner Beckerton for all your support over the past year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, as it Reef? <laughs> yes, th thank you, Councillor. It's Dee Dee. Thank, thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. My name is Dee Dee Reef. I live in Brighton. I've testified at many city council hearings on everything from keeping a local library open to last week's pilot hearing. But this is the first time that I've testified when I am beginning to feel a little foolish. Uh, why? Because year after year, including in FY22 and in going back to at least 10 years, I have presented the need for capital funds in the budget for the shoreline and woodlands restoration at Chandler Pond in Brighton. Every year I see millions of capital budget dollars go to ball fields and courts and playgrounds. And make no mistake, I'm a sports lover and I play both basketball and tackle football with my brothers. So I really appreciate the value of sports, sports fields and playgrounds. Um, and I just wanna quote uh, one of my neighbors who said to me, everyone loves children, but does the city not care about all the seniors who slowly perambulate around the pond for their physical and mental health? Yes, the restoration project won a 2021 CPA grant of $300,000 for the project, which we understand will cost a total of $2.3 million. Yes, Friends of Chandler Pond has been advised to apply for more CPA money. Oh, and I also just want to address Ms. Baker Eclipse. Uh, we did get a project manager with whom we are thrilled, um, but it's only a small piece of the shoreline restoration that is going before the CONCOM and going out to bid. And I wanna say that it is not fair to ask a friends group that has worked literally thousands of hours, including basic maintenance and close to dangerous maintenance, to patch together funding over who knows how many years 
to get a capital project done. It's also inexplicable to me that a, a park's capital budget that has gone from 36 million to 58 million over three years to, to have zero dollars for one of the city's largest parks and only ponds. So after years of work and so many unsuccessful requests, I'm also just beginning to feel a little betrayed by the city that the only city I've lived in as an adult, a city I've worked for as a job, and the city I love in part because it punches above its weight and size, and you could appreciate why I love that. I'm asking that $2 million be authorized in the capital budget in FY24 for the restoration of the Chandler Pond shoreline and woodlands. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne Jones. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, my name is Yvonne Jones and I'm, I'm a Dorchester resident and a longtime Franklin Park user. I serve on the Franklin Park Coalition Board of Directors. The park has always been my second home. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. During the pandemic, when most people decided to stay in place, I found comfort in just walking alone and enjoying the outdoor and or the park. And I just want to reiterate that I've been going to the park for walks, concerts, carnivals, cookout, you name it. I love Franklin Park and would love to see some needed changes in the park. Speaking on behalf of the Franklin Park Coalition Board, we were very excited to see the final Franklin Park Action Plan released in December. However, we urge you to fund the recommended recommendation outlined in the action plan. As my board um, member members, Kevin Batt and Sandy um, Bailey, um, I just want to echo some of the things that they said and some of what the uh, city councilors and others have said that um, we, we really would love to see in particular an increase in funding from the city operating budget for maintenance, woodlands uh, restoration, and park administrators as called for in the action plan. The parks department budget is less than 1% of the city budget. That's way too low for all the beautiful green space in the city, in our city and for Franklin Park, um, which is 500 acres. The old beer den and the overlook ruins desperately needs capital funding. At the Franklin Park Coalition, we hope the Emma Lewis Playhouse in the park will go back to the original overlook site and Miss Lewis's legacy can be recognized. Franklin Park has suffered from years of disinvestment. We ask the city council to fund the recommendations outlining the action plan to turn around the state of the park. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz Biza. Thank you very much, Councillor. My name is Liz Viza, President of Friends of the Public Garden, and I want to thank Chief White Hammond, Commissioner Woods, and all the Parks Department staff for all that you do for our parks. Since 1970, we have been partners with the city to care, renew, and advocate for the Boston Common, the Public Garden, and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. They are neighborhood parks for over 60,000 people, but more importantly, parks for the entire city, iconic parks for 7 million people a year come to enjoy. You know, our parks are the green lungs. They are the heartbeat of our city, and we have to make sure that we give them the resources they need to provide the physical, mental, and emotional support they uniquely offer for our community and every member of it. They are not amenities, they are necessities. So I am here advocating for the three downtown parks that are um, the ones that the friends take care of, as well as for the health of Boston's green space citywide as a member of Boston Park Advocates, which is a network of over 100 community partners. And it's important for us to recognize that while individual parks have needs that must be served, our green space is an ecosystem with no boundaries. Every acre needs adequate support. And I'm gonna now raise my voice to the chorus of people talking about 1%. So thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, so many other advocates that have talked about the fact that yet again, the Parks Department's budget is stuck below 1% of the city's total budget. 
And as the city works to realize the administration's vision of making our green spaces more climate resilient and state of the art with rain gardens, bioswales, and other design innovations for 21st century park system, it's critical we invest in the staff skills necessary to maintain them. You've heard people talk about capital and maintenance. Currently, the budget lacks that specialized skill level and capital funding is wonderful and we applaud it and we say, bring it on. But until, until and unless we have maintenance funding that supports that capital investment, it's gonna be a problem. So we need that cap maintenance funding to accompany and protect the capital investment that we make. I will say that all in the green space community are very enthusiastic about the new urban forest division, the hiring of a director and three arborists. So Councillor Flaherty, um, we are going to be realizing that, that goal of getting more trees cared for in the city. We also support the inclusion in the budget of three new full-time project managers to relieve the burden of too many capital projects for the PAC cap planning staff. I'm always amazed that they get this work done. Each of them has dozens of projects on their plate. In the downtown parks, we applaud the inclusion of funds to renovate the Tadpole Playground on the Common, which is heavily used and overdue for improvements, as well as provide funding to create an accessible way to visit the Shaw 54th Memorial from the Common. Really, really important that we provide accessibility to that particular monument and to every place in our parks, in our city's parks. We're also very enthusiastic about the money that's been included for the public garden maintenance facility and making that th those necessary improvements to the existing building to provide additional space within a, a very cramped precinct to carry on the important work of caring for our public garden and to support the staff that does that important work. I wanna thank you all in the council for your commitment to Boston's green spaces. Each of you know the power of public space in your lives, your family's lives and the lives of your constituents. And it's been inspiring whenever I hear count, counselors speak every year at this hearing about the importance of parks in their life and in their family and in their, their neighborhood's lives. But in order for us to support the irreplaceable green lungs and have them function at their highest and best, it is vital that they have the funding necessary for their care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Marie-Claire Dumornay. Hi, my name is Marie Claire. I am currently a resident of Alston, but originally from Roxbury. I have been a lifelong Franklin Park user. I also serve on the Franklin Park Coalition Board of Directors. I would like to urge the council to fund the recommendations for the Franklin Park Action Plan. There are many things in the action plan that we need. The park is in rough shape. The bear cages in the overlook rooms need to be saved. The woodlands have dying trees and invasive plants, and we need to save our park. This means funding from the city's operating budget for maintenance, park ecology, and management. It also means capital dollars for restoration projects. The less than 1% budget on the park needs to be increased. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, you logging in. Christine Rose. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, this opportunity to speak. I am a resident of Mattapan um, and a, um, I spent many days in Franklin Park. I am a member of the Black Girls Run, and we utilize the grounds for training and exercise. I've also participated in the annual Turkey Trot, not only as a runner or walker, but also as a volunteer. I'm also the owner of Four Corners Yoga and Wellness, and I've not only sponsored the Emma Lewis Playhouse and the Park concerts, but I've also volunteered during some of the concerts over the last few years. I'm on the Zoom today to ask you to please fund the recommendations in the new Franklin Park Action Plan. The park desperately needs an investment in operating and capital funds. I'm excited about the, off the recommendations to bring back to the Emma Lewis Playhouse and the original site at the Overlook Shelter Ruins, and that space has been an overgrown mess since the 70s and desperately needs attention. I'm so pleased to see the Parks Department work managing um, weeds that have begun last year. The city currently spends less than 1% of its budget on the parks, and we need more maintenance, more park rangers, more management in Franklin Park specifically. Increasing the Parks Department budget will help get the needs met in this beloved park used by so many of Boston's Black community. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. 
Thank you. Uh, Luis, uh, Elisa? Luis, Thank Elisa, you. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, and I'd like to thank um, Marianne Hammond and Ryan Woods and all the other members of the uh, Boston Parks Department who worked diligently um, to try to get this process uh, back on track. My name is Louis Salisa. I live at 68 Cedar Street. Um, I'm the founder of the Franklin Park Coalition with 11 members um, back in 1978. Um, we uh, took this process on because the park was being neglected. And to a large extent, it's still being neglected in many ways, even though a lot of effort has gone into it over the last few years. Um, there's a history that we have to take in consideration when we talk about budgets and what is being proposed through the master plan that is being uh, placed out there. The estimations of the amount of work to be done might be on estimate because of 40 years of neglect. There's a lot to try to retrieve in the historic park that is so essential and critical not just to the uh, social environment and cultural environment of Boston, but to the health and wellness of the people in our own community. This is Boston's center jewel of the Olmstead necklace. And, um, and so these are years of repair that have to be taken into consideration. But it doesn't make any difference what we put in the budget if we don't have a comprehensive program to uh, take care of it. The deterioration, which is taking place over the past 40 years, is the reason why $200 million is being proposed. A general maintenance and repair has to be done on a regular basis. That has been the challenge that I've been engaged with for more than 40 years. Um, just simple cleanup, just simple repairs that are done by the maintenance crew. There is a crew and it, it needs to be strengthened. There's no question about that. But those who are there should do their job. They should do it in a comprehensive way. They shouldn't cut trees and cut grass and just leave it lying there or throw it back into the park. It should never be a place where they don't finish what they're doing because that only exacerbates the situation. The need for having park rangers to work in Franklin Park, even though their authority has been challenged, it does make a difference to have people to look and see what's going on. So when the events are taking place and someone can do information, let people know that what they're doing, someone in the authority, um, like a park ranger, it makes a big difference. And so um, I know that having walked the park with other members early in the morning, we had people coming from out of our community who used to steal the cotton stones. <laughs> and then they would say, boy, the park is being neglected. It was not by the community. It's a big park, and it's not used properly. As people know, the area where the maintenance is now has been repaired and fixed up some. But the major deterioration was taking place on roads in which you know people generally didn't travel. So that's an issue we have to fix. And what has to be done now is the general maintenance along uh, Jewish Memorial Drive. The, 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 the amount of uh, stand and gravel that has been built up in the catch basins, they have to be cleaned, just like you clean the streets. The catch basins around the over, over walkway or circuit drive have to be cleaned. The lights that have been knocked down and not repaired have to be fixed. It gives a general appearance that the park is being neglected and people come through there and if they don't think the park is important, then they act accordingly. Um, I live on Seaver Street. I can tell you the faces of uh, Franklin Park is along Seaver from Walnut to Blue Hill Avenue, and it's been very poorly maintained. We have to fix it. We don't need $200 million to do that. We just need a comprehensive maintenance plan that we stick with. And we work in coalition because the members of Garrison Triad Neighborhood Association and myself, we're more than willing to go out and lend a hand. We just don't want to lend a hand <laughs> and then see it go back into the park because somebody who's with maintenance is annoyed that we're doing more than we're supposed to do as neighbors because I don't think we ever do enough. And though I appreciate the work of the Franklin Park Coalition and others who come to volunteer, you know, working on the park and the ongoing reform. We've faced the bear cages that I have for 50 years, and I'm glad to hear from uh, Chief Hammond that you are now in negotiation with the Boston uh, zoological people because it's, it, it needs to be, something needs to be done. It's a space that can be utilized in a more productive and useful way, clearly because there's still cross country activities that goes through there. And it means they can work on welcome activities that could be also a benefit economically for the community, as well as an entrepreneur or someone who'd like to do business. And I, I think it's an excellent jazz spot if you just look at it from this business. But please, we need to look at this plan and then we need to look at our present day activities in a more comprehensive way to get the park to work for itself. And it's, and so it's not just the circuit drive, it's not just around the place that is also the back part of White Stadium. Basic maintenance has to be done. Franklin Park is a jewel. In addition, we have the Malcolm X Park, which is on Washington Street and uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard. And 
it's a park and it needs support. So a, you know, a short rift given to concerns by the community that the top one is not safe for their children, that we don't necessarily need a fence or a doesn't. It, we can't approach public safety and use it on public parks in a callous way. If people say that they're not comfortable taking their children to a top lot and we've spent so much money to get repaired, then we should take that into consideration. We should actually not give us a diatribe as to what is not necessary in terms of design or terms, but we should talk and with the residents and the people who use the lot, the mothers, you know, and the fathers and the people who bring their children there and see what can be done to make them feel more safe and comfortable with it. There are a number of parks throughout the territory and throughout the whole city, but Jackson Trot is basically being very, you know, selfish and looking into our neighborhood. So where's Horatio Harris Park or whether it's Malcolm X Park, you know, and of course Franklin Park, we just want to see the resources of our city being utilized. One percent, of course, is, it doesn't make any sense because the parks play such a critical role in the quality of life of all residents of the city. And Franklin Park, more especially any park in the city, represents the goodness and strength of what we as an environmental community should be about. So I appreciate that we uh, spend whatever resources we can, but we spend it meaningfully in terms of making sure the work that's done is done well, the oversight of that work is done, and that there's a coalition between local law enforcement, park rangers, and others to make sure there's lighting, safety, cleanup, maintenance, and an opportunity to reach out to the community as a well. whole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tanya Grimes. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Grimes, and I am a a longtime user of the park, born and raised in Boston and living in Dorchester and Roxbury. And I am just excited about the fact that the money that was earmarked from the sale of the, the garage. But then when I found out that it wasn't going to be much, <laughs> I think now what everyone is saying is 1% is what we need to do, um, make happen. And um, I just also been saying the park Park is something that's crucial to, uh, am I still here? You are here. There was a little bit of a delay in your, in your. My, my laptop is overheating. I'm in my car and I've been on the laptop for some time. So, <laughs> um, uh, you're good see. now. Just, you're, I can't hear you now. So if you just go now, you'll be okay. fine. Okay. And, um, I just wanted to reiterate what everyone was saying about the park being so crucial to the community. It's something that I've um, been through the good and bad and ugly and hoping that the Elma Lewis um, can be, Elma Lewis playoffs in the park can be um, financed as well as ru the ruins be repaired and also to continue the, um, the program, the, to provide the funding for the programs that have been crucial to the community. And um, I wanna thank you all for your service and I appreciate your time. Thank you, I was muted. Uh, that is our final uh, public commenter. Uh, if you have anything you would like to send us, please send it to ccc.wm at gov, uh, sorry, at boston.gov, uh, and we will uh, deal with that. So that's www.cm, sorry, www.ccc. I'm over here giving out websites. It's www.boston.gov for redistrict, uh, for, look at me, I'm everywhere, for this committee, uh, which is Ways and Means. Uh, this is why we cover for friends. Uh, Ways and Means, uh, if you go to the Ways and Means website on boston.gov, you have a website that has all of the uh, budgeting for all of our departments. If you have any emails or messages that you would like to send for this specific department, please send an email to ccc.wm at boston.gov, which is the email. And then uh, tomorrow from two to five, we have a public comment period for folks who would like to speak on the budget, uh, one of three that we will have upcoming. With that, I'm going to uh, adjourn this meeting. I thank everyone for their uh, attendance. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.